Good morning. Uh, this is a joint hearing between Senate Health and Welfare, House Human Services, and House Health Care. It's January 14th, and welcome everyone. Our three committees will be taking testimony today on uh, how uh, the outcomes from the CRF funding that we received in 2020 and trying to understand the effect of what we've done, in particular on are in areas of human services, but then also with our provider stabilization fund. So we have a long list today uh, and we'll get to that in just a minute. But first I, I'd like to let um, Vice Chair of Human Services, Teresa Wood introduce herself and then Chair Bill Lippert of uh, House Healthcare to introduce himself. Um, good morning. Thank you, Senator Lyons. Um, I'm Teresa Wood, a rep state representative from Waterbury, representing the Washington Chittenden District. And uh, on behalf of Chair Pugh, she is um, otherwise engaged for the first part of this meeting this morning, but she will be joining us just a little bit late. So thank you all for being here. And good morning, uh, Representative Bill Lippert, Chair of the House Health Care Committee, representing Heinsberg. Uh, Again, I look forward to hearing from our, our, our witnesses today. And uh, maybe I will just uh, telegraph that we're looking to hear about new CRF dollar, new, I'm not sure the technical term is CRF anymore, but the new federal dollars. And we'll be uh, scheduling that again with the joint meeting of these three committees for next Wednesday morning. Okay. Uh, stay tuned for the specific time and witnesses. Okay, uh, thank you. And thank you all uh, committee members for being here. We're not going to introduce ourselves uh, any more than, than we have today, but um, so we'll just, we wanna move forward into the testimony. And before we do that, uh, two, two things, of course, please keep yourselves muted uh, when we are in committee and hearing testimony. And then secondly, uh, we're asking that you not use the chat. It becomes distracting. If you do need to communicate with the chairs, then uh, you can communicate directly with us about a concern or a, a question you have about your, your testimony. I wanna make sure we have time for everyone. So we're going to move as quickly as we can without losing the important words that you have for us today. And we and truly are looking forward to this. We know this has been an unbelievably difficult time for every person who's with us today. And in particular, those of you who have been working out on the ground for uh, helping people, uh, we get that. And so we're very interested in hearing your stories, hearing how the CRF funding has helped you how any of the policies that we've put in place have helped you, and then where are the gaps that exist and how we might systemically improve as we go forward. So th that's more or less our goal. And we're gonna start out with um, Sarah Clark, the Chief Financial Officer for the Agency of Human Services. And I believe we have a uh, testimony from a number of folks on our web pages. And Sarah, I think you're included in that list. So when you're presenting your testimony, for this is for witnesses, um, let us know if you have testimony submitted and then we'll be able to go and find it. And some of you uh, wanna share screen and we can allow for that. I think uh, Commissioner Squirrel has already asked for that. So we'll, we'll try to be as efficient as we can going forward. And I thank you again for, for being here looking forward to hearing every all the wisdom that's coming to us today. Truly, thank you. So Sarah, welcome and thanks for being here. Good morning, thank you for having me. I am going to share my screen. So we get oriented. Can you see my screen? Perfect. Okay, well, uh, welcome back. It's good to see everybody. Um, today, I'm planning to give you an update on the status of the coronavirus relief fund programs as appropriated by the legislature to the Agency of Human Services. At one point in time, when you last left um, at the end of last session, HS had approximately 
a half a million dollars, excuse me, $500 million, a half a billion dollars appropriated to us for coronavirus relief funds. That included some of the funding related to the early relief efforts that the Agency of Human Services had provided to our provider networks, as well as the legislatively created programs that we developed in collaboration. Since that time, um, as, as you are aware, through the Joint Fiscal Committee process, there have been adjustments to our original Coronavirus Relief Fund appropriations, where we now probably roughly have between 400 and 450 million dollars of CRF appropriations at the Agency of Human Services. So I'm going to build off of the testimony that I provided to you last session to give you an update across the roughly 20 CRF programs that have been established at the Agency of Human Services. There is a lot of information in this presentation and so I'm prepared to move quickly because I know you have a pretty lengthy list of um, folks scheduled to testify today, as well as Commissioners Hutt and Squirrel. An important um, piece of information that kind of changed our world um, at the end of the calendar year, we have been targeting over the last 10 months that the Coronavirus Relief Fund was set to expire on December 30th. So all of the action, all of the relief that we issued to our various networks was targeted with being complete by December 30th. And what, what that means is not necessarily that all of the cash had to be out of the door, but all of the services, all of the expenses had to be incurred by December 30th. This required us to move at a very quick but effective pace. As you know, right before December 30th, uh, the US Congress extended the Coronavirus Relief Fund for another year. I mention this to you for context, because even though we do have an initial year, the majority of our programs were really almost at the point of completion because we had been hard charging for so long. So I'm gonna just start going through the inventory of CRF programs. Um, in the secretary's office, there were three different CRF programs for AHS to grant funds to legal aid. Um, focusing on providing access to justice services, providing access um, for legal and counseling services for those who are at risk of or are experiencing homelessness, as well as some funding for information technology needs necessitated by the COVID-19 pandemic. Across all of those funds, um, a little bit more than a million dollars, the agency has executed those grants with legal aid and paid out or have expenses incurred for that full amount. In addition, I do want to point out to you that as it relates to providing assistance to Vermonters with electronic judicial filing fees, we are planning to amend that contract uh, with legal aid to add an additional $75,000 of support. The next program I'm going to talk about is um, an original appropriation of $2 million to AHS um, to distribute to vulnerable populations. The original appropriation was for $2 million. Subsequent to that, the Joint Fiscal Committee approved in early December, or excuse me, in mid-December, an additional $1.3 million. The agency distributed those funds through the departments, um, departments for Children and Families and the Departments for Disabilities, Aging, and Independent Living. The funds uh, through DCF, $2.6 million, um, was provided as stipends to families in the Reach Up program they received two stipends. Dale issued $700,000 to the DS Family Support Stipend Program. Those funds have been put out the door. The next program I'm going to talk about is $700,000 in grants that were made to two refugee organizations, $350,000 to the Association of Africans Living in Vermont and $350,000 to the U.S. Committee on Refugees and Immigrants Vermont Refugee Resettlement Program. Those grants have been executed and the funds have been paid out or encumbered through December 30th. And I know I'm moving fast, so if you need me to slow down, please just signal as, as that. The next program I'm going to talk about is $3 million that would per, was provided to EMS and ambulance service providers for a um, both a training and a stabilization program. Of the $3 million to date, 
roughly $2,873,000 has been issued. 900,000 for training purposes for paramedics and EMTs, and an additional almost um, $2 million um, for stabilization to EMS and ambulance service providers. AHS worked with the Vermont Department of Health to stand up the stabiliz stabilization program, also working with the various organizations to make sure that we receive their input in terms of the development of that program. You'll be receiving a legislative report on that tomorrow with some more details about providers that received funds through that program. There was another program um, related to EMS providers that was an additional $2 million to provide workforce stabilization funding to EMS and ambulance service providers. AHS, through the Department of Health, issued roughly 73 grants to providers, totaling $1.9 million. Again, you will also receive additional details on that program in the legislative report tomorrow. The next program I'm gonna talk about is one of our biggest at AHS, and that is the Hazard Pay for Essential Employees Program. If you recall, there were various stages of appropriation to support this program. In the end, through the two tranches of funding that were appropriated by the legislature, as well as additional funds that was provided through the JFC process, that program grew to be $60,600,000. AHS partnered with Department of Financial Regulation to administer both the first and the second rounds of this program. If you recall, the first round focused on uh, health and human services providers who um, allow those frontline employees to receive hazard pay for their efforts in the early phases of the pandemic. The second round expanded the um, eligible employers to include a more broad array of employer types where employees were working on the front lines during the heart of the pandemic. That is the round where the Department of Financial Regulation were amazing partners to the Agency of Human Services and allowed us to execute this program. To date, 1,192 employer organizations have received grants from this program. Roughly 3,240 former employees received payments. I should, um, pause for, for a moment to reflect that during the second phase of legislative appropriations for this program, it was determined that we wanted to provide these hazard pay payments to individuals that may at one time during the heart of the pandemic worked for an organization. Perhaps they no longer did, but we still wanted to be able to reward these employees for um, working through a very challenging time. And so we expanded the program to allow former employees to be able to receive um, either the $1,200 or $2,000 payment. The table at the bottom gives you a rough sense of the $60.6 .6 million that was appropriated, kind of where we are from an accounting perspective. It's important to note that we are still finalizing this program and that these numbers will change over time. But We've issued roughly $54.7 million in grants to covered employer types to distribute to their employees. We've also issued $5.3 million in hazard pay payments to former employees. There have been um, $335,000 of administrative costs. As well as, in addition to those amounts, there are some um, employers who received awards that subsequently returned those awards to the state of Vermont. And there are a variety of reasons why that, that may have happened uh, to include either a closer review of eligibility of their employees um, that caused these employers to return the funds to Vermont. So as of today, and though these, these figures, as I said, will change, we have spent in this program $57.5 million. The next table is probably very hard for you to read. <laughs> when you get the report tomorrow, you will see a report on the hazard pay program. You will be able to see more of these details clearly. But this just gives you a flavor by employer type um, how much was issued. Um, it's important to note in this table that it's duplicated, meaning it's not going to equal the total on the slide previously because employers had the ability to self-select their employer their employer type, and so they may have selected more than one. But it's it's good to understand 
you know, uh, where the dollars flowed as part of this program. And so I'll just pull out a few numbers for you. A little bit more than $12 million went to grocery store employees. $10 million went to healthcare facilities. And $13.3 million went to retailers. So again, you will receive this report tomorrow and certainly happen, happy to have a more in-depth conversation about that important program. So the next program I'm gonna talk about is the biggest one that the Agency of Human Services administered, and that is the Healthcare Provider Stabilization Program. As you know, even before this program was established in collaboration with the legislature, the Agency of Human Services moved quickly to provide supports to our critical providers to ensure that the healthcare system was sustained through the pandemic. Our focus was on preserving the healthcare system and Vermonters' ability to access healthcare services during the pandemic. Commissioners Squirrel and Hutt are gonna give you a little bit more detail. Um, later in this presentation about some of those early relief efforts to uh, critical provider groups. So this slide gives you a kind of a sense of the appropriation history for this program. So if you recall, we originally started at a $275 million program in Act 136. Act 154, which was during the fall session, um, actually reduced that overall appropriation by $27.5 million. In addition to that reduction, there were some key set-asides to allow the Agency of Human Services to cover some other critical areas, such as testing, the EMS Workforce Stabilization Program that I've talked about, and a round three that was targeted for the DAs and the SSAs to provide them continued relief from September 15th to the end of the year. That left available in the program when the legislature adjourned at the end of September, $238 million roughly. As you know, with the deadline of the Coronavirus Relief Fund being December 30th, agencies and departments across state government were working really hard to ensure that we were maximizing our use of this federal revenue leading up to the deadline. As such, as AHS moved through the administration of this very important program, it was clear at that point in time that there was funding available that could be reallocated through the joint fiscal process to other important needs in Vermont. And so you see the $78 million reallocation by the Joint Fiscal Committee that was done on November 5th. In addition, at that meeting, there was funding pulled out for more testing. As you've, I'm sure, seen the um, capacity of testing in the state has really been enhanced over the last couple of months. And we got approval to use some of the funds in this program to pay for our administrative costs. Leaving available for grants in this program, a total of roughly $156 million. And we, we've talked about this, I think at last session, but I'll maybe kind of quickly remind you of the process that we went through for this program. AHS stood up an online application via Salesforce this is a um, essentially a grants application system that was used not only by AHS, but by a variety of programs across state government, most notable, notably the economic recovery programs at ACCD. Our process was a need-based assessment where we looked at multiple factors to determine what an award amount would be for a provider. This includes the fiscal impact of business disruption for various revenue sources, increased expenditures related to COVID, any sort of mitigating actions that an organization may have taken to control costs, as well as looking at fund sources that they could have received from other, um, other, other sources. So for example, the federal government, there was a lot of aid that was provided direct from federal health and human services to providers. All of those were factors that we considered in terms of making awards. In addition, in this um, sphere, some of the providers are eligible for FEMA funding. If a provider was eligible for FEMA funding, they needed to pursue that FEMA fund source. And our grant program would issue them the 25% state match that would be needed for that FEMA award. It was a very labor intensive review process. <laughs> um, the team at AHS spent um, significant amounts of time reviewing the information to be able to make grant determinations. 
we did outreach to make sure we were communicating with all um, eligible applicants. And you can see I've included a link here um, to further information if you want the details um, of the grant programs. At that time, it was all geared to be completed by December 30th. And these grants are subject to the requirements of the single audit, which is important for the recipients to understand. We administered two cycles. Um, the first cycle opened on July 17th. The deadline was August 15th. It was for the time period March 1st of 2020 through June 15th of 2020. During that cycle, we received 351 applications and ended up issuing 190 awards. Those awards totaled $85 million from the Agency of Human Services. However, in addition, we partnered with the Agency of Commerce and Community Development because their economic recovery program was actually open and available to applicants before the healthcare provider stabilization program. If they had healthcare providers that came in through their door and were issued in a grant through the ACCD program, AHS agreed to reimburse ACCD for those healthcare providers. So we reimbursed roughly $1.9 million of grants to ACCD. I've included a link to the report on cycle one of the program. You will see, receive um, the updated legislative report tomorrow. <laughs> it's been a busy week for legislative reports at the Agency of Human Services. Cycle two of the program opened on October 19th and the deadline originally was November 6th. The time period for eligibility was March 1st through September 15th of 2020. We did reopen the um, the application from November 17th to November 24th, so that some providers who had started applications but didn't have a chance yet to finish them, we wanted them to come back through over that week to be able to finish their applications. We received 272 applications and we issued 128 awards as part of the second cycle. AHS issued $57.9 million of awards and then there was an additional 797,000 that was issued on behalf of the ACCD program. In addition, as I've mentioned br briefly earlier, there is a cycle three of sorts that's targeted to the DAs and the SSAs um, to total $3 million. We are in the process of working with our partners to um, complete and administer those grants. I want to bring to your attention an emerging issue um, that we have experienced at AHS with the kind of November, December surge in COVID cases in Vermont. And that is we do have some long-term care facility and other residential facilities that when they are dealing with an outbreak have needed some quick and relatively small infusions of cash to help them have the resources to be able to deal with the COVID outbreaks in their facilities. We have some um, parameters for that program that we've developed. For example, there has to be a COVID positive patient. Um, there has to be a financial need um, and it has to kind of be immediate and, and quickly needed. We've issued to date roughly $332,000 to about five providers. Again, some slides that are probably hard to see from your screen. Um, you'll see more detail um, in the PowerPoint that I provided um, to the committee assistant, as well as in the report that you will get tomorrow. But this just tells you um, by provider type, um, the amount of awards that were received in cycle one, cycle two, and then in total. So in total, across all cycles of this program and including the transfers to ACCD, $145.7 million has been issued as part of the Healthcare Provider Stabilization Program. This is just another way um, of looking at that same information, but it tells you the count of awards by provider type. And then just another breakout of information um, by hospitals, you can see who received awards um, in cycle one and cycle two. So hospitals received together um, about $110 million across cycle one and cycle two. For your information, 
uh, we were notified, um, I, I believe in November, that the state auditor's office was going to be doing a risk assessment for the healthcare provider stabilization program. Um, they've actually now moved from the risk assessment to they're doing an audit of the healthcare provider stabilization program. This is something that they're also doing for the other major uh, coronavirus relief fund programs in state government. I know they are doing them for the economic recovery programs that ACCD and tax administer as well. We actually have our entrance conference with the auditor's office this afternoon, and their preliminary objectives are to assess whether and how the Agency of Human Services ensured that those providers that we issued awards to met state and federal requirements um, as part of our grant program. And they're also very focused on ensuring that there was not a duplication of funding provided. So more information to come on that. And that's the, that's the healthcare provider stabilization program. <laughs> I expect you will probably at some point want some more information on that. <laughs> well, yes, I think each, each of the committees will, uh, with your, um, Acceptance will invite you in, I think, uh, for greater detail so we can ask some more specific questions. I really want to thank you for the work that you've done. I do understand this is a day before the report is due. Uh, we were sensitive to that when we invited you, so we're very uh, appreciative that you're here. So thank oh, you. Of course. Uh, I just have a one. Uh, I don't want to ask questions now, but um, something to think about is, as you were looking at need, uh, and obviously you were communicating and working with ACCD on all of this, but also there were other funds available to certain providers, uh, particularly healthcare providers, mm -hmm. that was outside of the money given to the state. And did you take that into account during the, okay. Uh, yes, we I, did. It was yeah. very important part of our methodology. Um, we actually, the Department of Vermont Health Access Oversight and Monitoring Unit would on a weekly basis pull down that information from the federal government. It's, it's publicly available by provider type. And so we would um, reconcile, you know, what an applicant had input in terms of the other forms of relief they received with um, what we are seeing from the federal databases. Thank you. Uh, that's that's helpful, and we'll keep that in mind as we go through the report that you send us. Um, okay, I, I I think a Bill or Teresa, do you have a, a single question for uh, Sarah? I think we're all set right now. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay. Yeah, I think I think uh, what you just said in terms of. For, particularly for new members, understanding why we initially appropriated $275 million. In fact, we thought that was not going to be enough. Uh, and sub, part of, so we'll, we'll hear more in our committee, but uh, we, what we learned was that hospitals in particular and other entities were eligible for FEMA dollars and for some other dollars. And so the total amount was able to be reduced and reallocated. And I don't think we can overemphasize the complexity of the work that uh, AHS uh, and ACCD, uh, all, all folks in the administration have done. And also, I do thank you for your uh, emphasis on the collaborative process between the legislature and the administration. This has truly been that, and uh, we appreciate that. Mm -hmm. So um, it I think we'll move on, and I want to thank you, and good luck this afternoon. So I do, I, I do have, and I, I know that um, Commissioners Squirrel and Hutt are scheduled after me. I do have, but for other departments, some updates on their CRF programs. I think I can, if, if you want me to go through them or we can go right to Commissioners Squirrel and Hutt. I'm fine either way. You've got the information. Yeah, I think we should just move ahead if, uh, and I don't know what your schedule is. We can, we can come back. We can circle back to this either today or another day and uh, get into greater depth. But so I think we should move on to the two commissioners. Um, and I'm actually asking you, Sarah, if you agree with that decision. Yeah, that's fine. I can okay. I can come back at any time to talk about the other programs. Um, okay. And you've got the materials. So whatever yeah. works best for committee. Good. Why don't we do that? We don't want to uh, overload ourselves this morning. We're, we can do that tomorrow. Okay. All right. Um, 
And so we do have two commissioners with us today, uh, Commissioner Sarah Squirrel from Department of Mental Health. Uh, Commissioner Squirrel, welcome. Good morning. Good morning. Um, we're, we're just going to move right along into uh, testimony. And thank you for being here. Of course, yes. Thank you, Senator Lyons. Good morning, everyone. For the record, uh, this is Sarah Squirrel, the Commissioner of the Department of Mental Health. And joining me this morning is Commissioner Hutt. So I will allow her to introduce herself. Good morning, everybody, and Happy New Year. It's lovely to see you all. Um, Monica Hutt, I'm the Commissioner of the Department of Disabilities, Aging, and Independent Living, and it's a pleasure to be here this morning. Thank you for being here. We greatly appreciate it, both of you. Thank you. Uh, so I think if it's if it serves the chair um, or the chairs, um, I will also share my screen to continue the presentation where Sarah Clark left off. Uh, let's see here. Okay, can everyone see that okay? Yes, yes. Wonderful. Okay, well, I will just jump in in the interest of time. I just want to thank the committee for your time this morning again to reiterate um, Sarah Clark's comments about the collaborative efforts here. Um, I also know that there are many um, providers that you are waiting to hear from, so we will try to move through this as quickly as we possibly can. Um, certainly the areas that we wanted to cover today was just an overview of some of our relief efforts um, specific to the mental health system of care and the developmental services system of care in addition to older Vermonters and long-term care facilities an overview of some of the CRF funds that we've provided um, to the designated agencies and specialized service agencies, an overview of other CRF initiatives um, that the Department of Mental Health has supported um, in addition to Dale, um, and then per the chair's requests, um, some thinking about some of the impacts that we've seen related to the pandemic and opportunities that we see as we go forward. So first and foremost, um, when the pandemic hit the state uh, last March, um, our primary priority was stabilizing our essential mental health and developmental services providers and other services across the state. Um, it was absolutely essential that we ensure that those critical services for Vermonters could continue. Um, so we worked diligently to ensure that we had a strong and stable system for both mental health and developmental de disability service system our long-term care services and support system, and our older Vermonter service system. We know that this network of services and providers is absolutely essential to keeping our community-based human services system intact. Our focus on stability of providers throughout the pandemic was always our North Star. Um, and without these systems, without these individuals, without these direct care workers, uh, we certainly know the pressure that, that would have put um, on our emergency departments, hospitals, and public safety. And I do just wanna take a moment and thank um, all of our leadership across our network of providers, some of whom you will be hearing from today. And of course, all of the direct care staff across the system of care. Um, they have truly been essential um, showing up every day to ensure that vulnerable Vermonters are still receiving care. So I just want to highlight a little bit of our early relief that we provided um, specifically to the DAs and SSAs, develop um, our designated agencies and our specialized service agencies. So when the pandemic first hit, you know, we really stepped back and said, what can we utilize or leverage within existing resources to create stability? As many individuals are aware on these committees, we did, we have implemented payment reform for the Department of Mental Health. Um, so all of our DAs and SSAs are paid under a case rate. Um, so they get a monthly prospective payment to provide services. We've been able to leverage that model to provide flexibility, um, to adjust the reconciliation on the back end um, so that um, they can continue to provide those services and receive that funding. Um, we also moved quickly in partnership with DIVA to ensure that telephonic services were approved for Medicaid billing. Um, we expedited the payments um, for the EMRs that the DAs were also um, providing. 
Um, and Dale Im implemented flexibility within their billing, which enabled agencies to bill consistently on a daily rate and then monitor, again, to create that stability for our providers across the system. We also knew that quickly we needed to stabilize the workforce. Um, so we immediately put into place, um, in collaboration with AHS, some efforts to provide hazard pay to the DAs and SSAs. Um, so specifically, we were able to provide $7.6 million, specifically for hazard pay and incentive pay for the DAs and SSAs. This also included family difficulty of care stipends and stipends for shared living providers, um, for the Dale providers. In addition to that, we provided $3.2 million in additional COVID relief. So our total early relief specifically for the DAs and SSAs was $10.8 million. And again, these funds were provided to cover prevention supplies, increased costs related to IT and telehealth expenses, hazard pay, and other COVID-related expenses. Um, and Monica, do you want to talk a little bit about that last bullet in terms of the conversion of underutilized respite dollars? Sure. I think one of the um, one of the most important tenants, as Sarah or as Commissioner Squirrel has already spoken to, was trying to stabilize our providers. We also recognized that what that uh, the pressure that the pandemic was putting on individuals and families. And so one of the early things that we did was initiate um, flexibility within the individual funding structures for families and individuals, which enabled agencies to work with those individuals and families to convert dollars that weren't being drawn down um, into stipends for individuals, families, and shared living providers. And that flexibility has continued throughout the pandemic. Um, and I'll speak to that a little bit more um, a little bit later in the testimony, but just wanted to make sure that people recognized that as we were working to stabilize and support our providers so that they would exist safely through the pandemic and be available on the other end, we also recognized the kind of pressure that that put on individuals who were receiving services and counting on those. So tried to mitigate that as we could. Great. So that was a quick overview of some of the early relief that we provided specifically to the DAs and SSAs. And then Sarah Clark gave an overview of the healthcare stabilization program, uh, both rounds one and two, which our DA and SSA system were able to apply for as well. Um, Sarah Clark already reviewed some of those cycle periods and in total in round one and two, in addition to those early relief dollars, uh, we've provided an estimated $5.8 million to the DA and SSA network. Again, same source of funds related to um, COVID-related expenditures, revenue losses, um, and demonstrated unmet need. Um, I would also note, as Sarah Clark um, outlined in her presentation, that the DAs and SSAs were also authorized by the legislature $3 million of CRF, um, to be utilized for a third round of healthcare stabilization through the time period of September 15th and December 31st. Again, that $3 million has the same source of funds, so the same expectations in terms of how it can be utilized. Um, the status of that is that it is in process, and the final application is due January 22nd from those DAs and SSAs. Um, and Commissioner Hutt, do you want to speak to the second round of family difficulty of care stipends? Yes, I think that that was the, uh, and, and it, there is a merge between what Commissioner Squirrel and I are sharing and what Sarah was able to share at the very beginning. So that second round of stipends, Sarah Clark spoke to as she was talking about the very specific legislative program that was created, that was distributed both through DCF and ReachUp and through Dale. That was where the, those funds came from to enable us to do that second round of direct family stipends. Um, so you will see throughout the rest of this presentation, um, and certainly on the Dale side, the, the healthcare stabilization, the legislative appropriations for CRF and programs that the agency were able to do um, sort of jumbled together um, and spoken to more specifically uh, in terms of response and results. But Sarah Clark is, the, is, the, is our North Star in terms of the dollars and where they came from. So we will always defer back to her when that comes up. Thank you. Um, so this slide is just an overview of the total CRF for our DA and SSA network specifically. It's inclusive of the early relief that I noted, 
um, estimated awards for healthcare stabilization round one and two, and healthcare stabilization round three for a total of $19.7 million. Um, and again, um, our community mental health agencies, specialized service agencies have done a tremendous job in focusing on retaining their staff, maintaining safety, transitioning to telehealth, and really working on establishing more mobile and nimble service delivery. So again, hats off to our community providers um, and leadership for their incredible work over the past several months. I wanna talk a little bit about some of the other um, CRF initiatives um, that the Department of Mental Health specifically was, wor was working on. Um, working in collaboration with the legislature, we were provided with an additional 500K to focus on suicide prevention. Um, obviously, we know the pandemic has significantly impacted the well being of Vermonters um, when we worry about increased unemployment, social isolation, fiscal instability, and family stress are all increased risk factors for suicide. We wanted to make sure that we had a comprehensive approach and implemented several strategies. Um, to support suicide prevention efforts across the state. Those included expanding our zero suicide efforts, expanding our national suicide prevention lifeline, um, developing targeted suicide prevention resources that are culturally informed, um, expanding our mental health first aid, and of course, expanding our elder care clinician programs across the state um, to support older Vermonters who we know are also at very high risk. Um, in addition to that, we were also able, and thank you to the legislature uh, for additional funding to support Pathways Warm Line, um, which is a peer run support line. They were able to expand their hours to be 24 hours a day, um, seven days a week. I was just reviewing a report yesterday on an update on that. Um, just tremendous work on behalf of Pathways. They actually exceeded their targets for calls, um, averaging over a thousand calls per month. Um, and expanding their outreach efforts. Um, we are also happy to report that we'll be able to continue that expansion by leveraging some of our SAMHSA um, emergency grant dollars as well. And I will turn it over to Commissioner Hutt to talk a little bit about some of the Dale specific programs. Great, thank you, Commissioner Squirrel. Um, before I jump to this, I do also wanna just express Dale's gratitude to Sarah and her team, because in addition to those CRF dollars that are supporting the elder care clinicians, the Department of Mental Health also found uh, general fund dollars um, to support that program. So it actually ended up being an, a $100,000 of an increase to that elder care clinician program. Um, we're very grateful for DMH's continued support around that. And you all know how valuable that program is, as it is, really provides clinical supports to older Vermonters who are homebound and who can't access typical outreach or um, typical outpatient work. Um, so more and more critical, I think, as the world turns and, and this progresses on, I'm just really grateful to Sarah and her group for, for being able to do that. Um, from a Dale perspective, we had agreed that Sarah would really cover our designated agencies and specialized service agencies, um, but we, I wanted to make sure that we spoke to the different networks that Dale touches across the rest of our department, um, not in as much detail as Sarah Clark was able to offer, or even as much detail as we just offered on the designated agencies and specialized service agency system, but knowing that these three, your three committees particularly really look across all of these systems. Systems, I wanted to at least give you a, a small flavor for each of the networks that we work with in Dale um, and what we've been able to do. Um, as Commissioner Squirrel stated at the very beginning, you know, the goal at the very the very, very start of the pandemic was to create stabi stability and sustainability um, for service provision and for these providers. Um, so there was a, a component and a, and a track where we were working with what services were able to be delivered, but also recognizing that we needed our system to come out the other end of this pandemic. They needed to be stabilized financially in order to be available to Vermonters um, when the world becomes a little bit more normalized again. And so that became a primary focus for us um, across all of these different uh, systems. Um, so in addition to all of the funding um, and the, the 
conversations that we're having today, it would be wonderful a little bit later on in the session to be able to talk with you about some of the flexibilities that we created, some of the changes in practice that we utilize to sustain these providers and to sustain services in really creative ways. Um, it's a lot to cover. Um, and I know we wanted to stay focused on CRF for today, but I wanna make sure that we, we recognize that our support hopefully was experienced by our networks as not only financial, but as, as flexibility in what we were asking from them and how we were asking them and enabling them to work. So just covering really quickly um, through some of the networks that Dale supports. Adult day programs, as most of all of you know, um, were required actually to close. They were asked to close at the very beginning um, in, in March. And um, actually they were working towards reopening at the very beginning or the end of the summer and the beginning of the fall, but had to close once again as the, as the surge in infections and COVID-19 um, made it untenable for them to operate safely. Um, so in addition to healthcare stabilization dollars that they were able to apply for, um, there was specific CRF funding um, supported through the legislature and through the Dale budget to ensure that they could operate completely. This covered their operational costs based on what they gave to us as needs. Um, so that has been tremendous. So July through September, they were there was $2.5 million to maintain the adult day programs. Um, in October through December, an additional tranche of CRF dollars that covered their full operating costs so that they could sustain their staff um, and, and um, work to, to be available to families and individuals, um, both during the pandemic and afterwards when they can finally fully reopen. Um, thinking about our area agencies on aging, which all of you again are all very familiar with, um, and considering that one of their most critical functions throughout the pandemic has been nutrition supports and meal delivery, CRF dollars were available to them um, again, April through June, and then September through December to enhance the funding that we were able to receive through Title III C, the Older Americans Act. So there were dollars that went um, to senior centers and meal sites through our area agencies on aging, first to address the gap in the enhanced rates that the Older Americans Act created for meals, for meal preparations. There was still a gap in terms of costs. And so those first $600,000 from CRF filled that gap for our meal programs in our senior centers. And then the second tranche of dollars, the 565, um, actually created um, the ability for the area agencies on aging to continue the enhanced rates that the Older Americans Act had set through the pandemic. Um, again, I'll speak a little later in testimony about what we are anticipating coming back down through Title III C in the Older Americans Act, but just important to know that we were trying to supplement for the area agencies on aging and our meal preparations. We certainly saw increases in uh, the, in the number of meals that were happening um, and tremendous creativity across provider communities in terms of how those meals were delivered. Um, there was a shift away obviously from congregate meals, but um, some real interesting uh, workarounds to make sure that older Vermonters and Vermonters with disabilities were receiving meals. We did also reach out just as an aside to Vermont Center for Independent Living. Um, as it turned out, the federal government was very, very supportive and generous to them. And they ended up not needing any additional dollars, but were able to enhance um, and accelerate the meals that they were providing to individuals with disabilities across the state. Sarah, you wanna to jump to the next slide for me? Great, yeah. thank you. No um, so some of the other networks that you know that we are engaged in and involved with at, at Dale, um, the skilled nursing facilities and our long-term care facilities. So not only our nursing homes, but our residential care, our assisted living facilities and the therapeutic community residences that are licensed across the state. Um, they were all eligible to apply for healthcare stabilization dollars throughout the, the, the different rounds of the HCS program. Um, but additionally, for skilled nursing facilities in particular, there were some really significant hits at the very beginning of the pandemic. And so we created a, a, an accelerated sort of shortened version of our normal 
um, emergency financial relief program for nursing homes, we call it EFR, that works through the Department of Rate Setting or the Division of Rate Setting that sits now in DIVA. Um, and we did push out some CRF dollars to nursing homes that were in immediate jeopardy at the beginning of the pandemic, not only because of increased costs, but because of the cost of staffing, um, the personal protective equipment that folks needed to buy and loss of revenue. And again, I'll speak to that as a systems issue that we saw that, that sort of stalling of the ability of um, admissions to happen across that system. Um, but that, that was a really critical component of an initial response. Our home health agencies were eligible to apply for healthcare stabilization, um, and I believe were and also were uh, able to apply for the hazard pay program. They um, certainly had to modify much of what they did, um, but they, unlike most of our other providers, needed to continue to deliver face-to-face -face services um, and did so in the midst of a pretty challenging time and continue to do so. Um, they really weren't able to pull back from that direct essential service delivery in the way that other providers really had to pull back because the services that they were delivering were medical services and were critical. Um, and I'm sure that they will speak to that um, a little bit later on in the testimony, but they really continued on um, in terms of service delivery and, and more typical billing. Um, Long-term care facilities outbreak response, Sarah Clark referenced it. We are seeing now a need for some emergency Re response to some of the smaller facilities as outbreaks occur. Um, so to date, there have been five residential care homes that had it, that had outbreaks. Um, and for a residential care home, it can be a large, but can also be a very small facility. So five or six or seven or 10 residents and 10 staff. Um, and in some of those facilities, we saw outbreaks that literally um, took over the entire building where everybody was positive with COVID-19. Um, and so the ability and the necessity of supporting them quickly with funding to pay for supplemental staff, to get meals catered for the personal protective equipment that they needed to, in, to maintain prevention, um, infection prevention and control procedures. Um, they needed fast relief. They needed it to be quick. They needed it to be simple. Um, and we were able to do that through CRF, which we're really grateful for. Additionally, the state of Vermont and Dale created an emergency staffing pool um, in, on, in a contract with uh, TLC so that we've got 40 staff across the state, 20 in a staffing pool and 20 per diem that are deployed as necessary to any outbreak that occurs if there are no other staffing options. Um, that's happening on a very regular basis. We are still seeing and consulting on outbreaks uh, I literally can look back at my calendar. There are seven or eight calls every day for the last several weeks. We were consulting immediately with facilities and have been deploying that staffing pool as part of the response, which I think has been absolutely critical um, in terms of, of really ensuring that outbreaks don't get out of control. One of the things that I would love for us to be able to talk with this legislative group about in a few months is the outbreak response that Vermont has created really recently BDH has started crunching some of the numbers and have um, discovered that the outbreak response, the rapid response that Vermont has been able to employ to our long-term care facilities has actually prevented more outbreaks than actually occurred um, simply because of the structure that we put in place to consult around needs almost immediately. Um, and that staffing pool I think has been a critical component of that. I'm gonna turn this back over to Commissioner Squirrel to talk a little bit about the impacts of mental health. So yeah, I'm, uh, Commissioner Squirrel, I I'm, wanna be very sensitive to the time and the folks that we have lined up coming after you. And is there a way that we can wrap this up within the next five or seven minutes? Uh, yes, of course, we All can right. absolutely do that. Terrific, um, thank you. And, and we will, um, we are very much aware of the need to have you folks back in uh, and you keep telling us that and we hear you. <laughs> That's great, thank you. It's unusual for us, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> of course, so uh, just to continue, I did wanna highlight um, while our response has been tremendous across the state, 
Um, we know that there are going to be ongoing impacts related to COVID, particularly on our mental health system of care. Um, that includes the impact of social distancing and quarantine requirements. Um, specifically for our residential facilities, you can only imagine how challenging that has been to manage. Also decreased capacity just to ensure appropriate social distancing, et cetera, within many of our facilities. Um, a real focus and attention on remote learning and impact on children and youth. We know any kind of uh, public health emergency will have both short-term and long-term impacts on children and youth. And this is why fundamentally our efforts to keep our public schools open have been so critical. Um, we worry about the needs of children and youth in terms of their social, emotional, and behavioral development and the widening achievement gap that we might see as a result of COVID um, and school absenteeism. Um, access gaps are another area we continue to look at. We have seen reduced capacity across some areas of our system. Um, so that's something we need to continue to look at. Uh, Co-occurring issues, of course, we are continuing to see increases in substance use um, overdoses, particularly for individuals who are seeking inpatient care. Um, we've also seen some increases um, related to overdoses um, and substance use issues with our youth as well. So again, another area we wanna focus on overall well-being and wellness. We know that across the state, across the country, um, certainly we worry about just the general mental health needs of Vermonters. We know that many are reporting um, the negative impacts on their mental health and well-being. Uh, workforce, I wanna note um, two aspects of that, availability, and of course the impacts of COVID on our workforce. Um, they have been tremendous, um, but they are tired. Uh, we worry about burnout. So again, we wanna to continue to focus on the well-being of our workforce across our system and of course, service delivery and quality. Um, the only last piece I would note is that we also need to continue to focus on uh, racial and ethnic disparities in access to mental health care and health care in general. Um, we know that racial and ethnic minorities have less access to mental health services, are likely to receive poorer care. Um, so really making sure that we're looking at cultural competency I'm focusing on our new Americans um, across the state in Vermont. And our solutions are not just about broadly improving healthcare access, but really tailoring the provision of care to remove any obstacles that minority individuals might face to work with our communities and to really address this as a public health issue. Uh, so I will continue um, just with the opportunities, continuing to leverage telehealth, which has really expanded access. However, there are limitations um, to our expansion of telehealth. We have several current federal grants that we are leveraging across the state that we are working on. And we are also anticipating increases in some federal funding, particularly for the Department of Mental Health. We anticipate increases to our mental health services block grant, increases for suicide prevention, and for Project AWARE. Um, and I will turn it back over to Monica. And I will talk very fast. So in addition to what Sarah has talked about, or Commissioner Squirrel, sorry, I keep doing that. Um, Commissioner Squirrel has spoken to in terms of mental health, which we know impacts the disability community and our older Vermonters. I would just add to that and echo that the isolation has been um, tremendously impactful across our system. We know that ourselves. We know that for our more vulnerable populations. We also know that isolation has a physical impact on and, a, and an impact on our physical health um, in addition to risks to our emotional health and mental health well-being. Um, so really realizing that that's going to be an issue ongoing. I, I think that access to necessary services throughout this pandemic has been really challenging. You know, we were in the very awkward position of needing to define what was essential and what was not. Um, that was very challenging and has been challenging for individuals and families throughout. So recognizing that that's been an impact and that some people have not received the services that they needed. Um, maybe they were not considered essential, but they were still necessary, and that has been an ongoing issue. Limited access to community. For as much as we are all isolated, sometimes that trip to the grocery store is the one thing that's kind of keeping us going throughout the week, and that has been limited for individuals with disabilities and older Vermonters even more so. So recognizing that that critical um, connection and just that critical kind of a function hasn't been necessarily as available as we would like it to be. Tremendous impact to employment. Individuals with disabilities and older Vermonters potentially lost the jobs that they had because they couldn't receive the supports. And as we go into an economy that's inherently changed, 
because of this, I do worry about competitive employment for Vermonters with disabilities and older Vermonters and hope that opportunities will remain there. There are some silver linings, but certainly there's some great loss. And I spoke earlier to the fact that with all of our long-term care residential programs struggling to manage pandemic and the risk of that, there are individuals who ended up stuck in hospital or stuck in nursing home, not able necessarily to transition to a lower level of care when that's really what they wanted and what was required for them. So there's been a real um, stickiness in the system that we have had to try to address always opportunities in any kind of a crisis. So in addition to some federal uh, funding opportunities, we're, which we're still waiting to understand, waiting to get some numbers on to see how they might be helpful. Um, we spoke earlier to the, some of the flexibilities that were created in terms of telehealth and telehealth billing. Um, Medicaid has been incredibly flexible. Medi Medicare continues to lag behind in that. And I would love to see this pandemic as an opportunity for us to push federally for Medicare to become as fluid as Medicaid is when we talk about telephonic billing. This has created some opportunities for people to receive supports telephonically and through video in, in ways that they never had before. And I don't want us to lose some of what we've learned about how to do things differently. Our providers specifically have been incredibly creative. The designated agencies, the specialized service agencies, our adult day programs, the so senior centers that have really created online communities for people, been able to push out. Um, exercise classes and activities that have made people able to connect in ways that they never had before. We don't want to lose the things that have worked well. We want to add them into our service delivery as we go forward. Um, and finally, I know from a Dale perspective, our ability to communicate with stakeholders has been enhanced tremendously by moving to online platforms. And while we look forward to seeing people in person again, we don't want to lose the fact that sometimes for people with mobility issues or transportation issues, those telephonic video Zoom opportunities allow people to be engaged in a way that they never had before. And we don't want to go back to a place where we're um, counting them back out. We want to make sure that we in enable that to move forward. So I think at that point, we're done with our formal presentation. Thank you for your time this morning. We greatly appreciate it. Absolutely. Oh, well, thank you. This is uh, very helpful. And I think um, probably more than we expected, but I think very much valued. Uh, and we do appreciate that, especially the new members who are here with us on our various committees. So um, we are going to, uh, and, and we also heard loud and clear that we will have you back uh, for greater depth on uh, some or all of this. So thank you for that. And I would like to acknowledge that Representative Pugh, Chair of uh, Human Services, is here with us. And um, welcome, Representative Pugh. All right. Well, we need to move on. And I know that we have uh, we have a great deal of testimony that we want to hear. And we'll, so we'll just move right through the the witness list that we have on our agenda. Um, and the next person up is Julie Tesler. And Julie, I don't know if you and Mary and Heidi are going to be testifying together or how you're going to do that. So I'll just turn it over to you and let you introduce yourselves. Thank you very much. My name is Julie Tesler. I work at Vermont Care Partners. That is an association of 16 designated and specialized service agencies that provide developmental mental health and substance use disorder services. Um, I have, we put something onto the uh, committee websites that just gives you a link to our website. So for those of you who are new, um, please check it out. For all of you, we'll be sending you an annual report. It's short, easy um, to look at um, and would love the opportunity to speak with any of you at any time and also connect you to your local agencies. Um, I'll be, very quick today and, and if Mary and Heidi are going to really talk more about the, the topic at hand. But I do want to point out um, that as when I work with the agencies, one of the observations today is the, the wave has yet to crest, that the, the trauma caused by this pandemic is going to be lasting and it's going to be building. It's, it's not like we'll all get vaccinated and things will go back to normal. So 
we're seeing an increase in demand um, for our services, not just our mental health services, substance use disorders. And even if you go to the people we serve with developmental disabilities, the amount of isolation they're experiencing is creating psychiatric distress for them, just like it does for the rest of us. Um, and we're not able to continue some things like some of the supported employment and, and time in the community. So it's affecting everyone we serve. Um, I think we've done a really good job in meeting people's needs, um, maintaining services, keeping people safe, maintaining our staffing levels, but it has been challenging. Not all agencies have been able to maintain all the staffing. Um, and we are really learning from some of the innovative services and Mary will talk about that um, as we move forward. I wanna take this time to thank all legislators who have supported us provided the $19.7 million in CRF funding, it made a huge difference um, and who enabled us to have the flexibilities to meet needs in new ways and to have some flexibilities in staffing and things like that. The Agency of Human Services, the Department of Mental Health, Dale and the Department of Health have all been so responsive and so supportive. It's really been an amazing partnership, especially that first phase, those first three months of COVID. Uh, I, they, it was just amazing how um, quickly uh, the departments worked with us and the agency worked with us to make sure that we were able to continue services. We've also had really wonderful partnerships from other health providers and our community partners, including housing agencies. Um, and together, I think Vermont is doing an amazing job in meeting people's needs and not perfect, but when I listen to other states and the experiences that they're having there, I know that Vermont's efforts have really been superior because of our ability to work together. So um, today, uh, Heidi Hall, who's the Chief Financial Officer at Washington County Mental Health Services is gonna give you an overview of the resources that we've been working with. And then Mary Moulton, the Executive Director of Washington County Mental Health Services will give you an example of how those funds were used what's working, where are some gaps, what we've learned. So thank you for your time today. We hope that we'll have a continuing dialogue with you on this topic. Hi, I am Heidi Hall. Um, as Julie mentioned, I am the CFO here at Washington County Mental Health. I am also this year's chair of the statewide designated specialized service agencies um, CFO group. Um, and we pulled this information together. And I'm really, I'm only gonna take a second just because um, Sarah did a great job um, talking about the different funding levels. So you don't need to hear it from me as well. I did also wanna point out though that we, um, the designated agencies receive um, tremendous support from the state, but we also received tremendous support from our local community partners. Um, everybody really stepped up. We had face mask donations, meals delivered, water, hand sanitizers. The community was absolutely out there and showed and showed why Vermont, we're so proud to be Vermonters for sure. Um, other funds that the designated agencies were able to access were the federally administered CARES Act. Um, that was a, a big lift. On um, the PPP, some of our smaller agencies, agencies that have under 500 employees were able to access the PPP funding, which is the payroll protection program. Um, they're still waiting to hear if those are loans or grants, but that still was um, a big lift or big um, assistance. Um, other things that, you know, Sarah Squirrel mentioned that we have other small federal and local grants. One other thing that I'm not sure was mentioned, but this, the Department of Mental Health used the flexibilities afforded to them to case rate our school-based services through um, June of last year um, to help mitigate the loss um, due to the fee-for-service nature of our school-based programs, and that is huge. Um, that ended in June, um, and they are looking to try to case rate that again. That is um, somewhat of a gap this year. Um, agencies will be feeling that tremendously um, until we are back to working with the kids full-time. We have the staff, but as you can imagine, not being able to work with them the same number of hours that we were face-to-face um, -face hours or even telephone um, hours um, has, will be a gap through um, pandemic. Um, that said, I don't really have much more on that. I, I think we'll just um, turn it over to Mary who can talk about what we did with those funds. 
Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for having us today. I'm Mary Moulton. I'm the executive director at Washington County Mental Health and actually uh, also serve as the president at Vermont Care Partners, which Julie referenced, which represents the DAs and SSAs. Um, it, it's just such an uh, opportunity, and Sarah and um, Monica, our commissioners, laid this out for us. Um, but the support that we received from our state partment partners was crucial from the beginning. We met with them, continued to meet with them weekly. I think there's quite a story to be told and how we utilize these dollars. And um, they were absolutely essential to our operations and to upholding the system. And the system just could not fail during this time because it would have gravely affected the availability of hospital beds potentially um, that might be needed by COVID patients. So when this all started, you know, we did not see people going to the emergency rooms. And when we began the key uh, for us, um, starting on March 7th at Washington County Mental Health, setting up an incident command system was communication and education to clients, to home providers, uh, to staff, um, and to, uh, to all of our, um, uh, other folks that we were dealing with, working with, so that we were able to give them the most recent information on safety. Um, this uh, required some purchase of equipment that we didn't have, so we used a multi-modality approach to communications. Everybody receives information differently. We did videos, um, we did snail mail, a lot of it to get that out to our home providers. Um, we have a director of nursing who is just uh, tremendous and led us in this effort. So um, in beginning to do that out of the gate, um, we uh, we did everything we could to uh, help us, particularly we have about 22 residential settings at Washington County Mental Health. And so we uh, wanted to be able to continue to serve all of those people. Hazard pay made a huge difference for us. We were able to keep our crisis bed programs open. Um, psychiatric beds did come offline in uh, some hospitals due to spacing issues, um, due to staffing issues, uh, due to planning for potential disaster issues. And so we operated uh, at 90% during the pandemic during with our five crisis bed uh, beds and in our region. And actually uh, many of the DAs throughout the state maintain very high levels of census during this period of time. So flow through the system was extremely important when we had crisis. So it involved conversations on whether someone had to quarantine before they came, whether they need testing before we came, they came, and that involved a lot of uh, collaboration with our community partners. Um, personal protective equipment, which we purchased was key. And I'm sure you can imagine how once the market knew how much we needed it, uh, the prices inflated. So we were all spending a lot more money on PPE than we expected. And for our residential facilities, which we, of course, ran face to face every day um, across the board that involved masks and face shields and foot covers and gowns uh, if we needed them. And we had a presumptive positive case. We needed to quarantine people in that case. We were very fortunate um, up until recently in not having to do any, uh, but probably two, two or three quarantine situations. And so, um, you know, that involved going back to the videos on teaching people how to don and doff their gowns so that we did not have further contagion. So all parts of the behind the scenes stories, um, telehealth, we pivoted, um, and this is where we get into the use of devices and connectivity and the money we spent there. Um, we pivoted within 24 to 48 hours to telehealth, and we were able to maintain connection uh, on with those that we were doing therapy with, case management with. Um, we needed to get devices into the hands of our clients uh, we did that through the money that came to us that you uh, that you sent in our direction, channeled in our direction. Then there were Wi-Fi uh, issues around connectivity. Um, so within our residentials for kids that were no longer going to school and staying at home in the residential, we have five of those with four kids in each. We had to be um, making sure that we put in what are called WAPs, wireless access devices. So we boost the ability to let them do their schoolwork every day. Um, so other agencies rented spaces for this and they had to do the same thing. Uh, so devices, um, connectivity, and some of the technology and more expensive um, 
improvements that had to go with that. Um, there were other um, arrangements for transportation so that we could keep people moving in, um, into, into their doctor's appointments. In the beginning of the pandemic, uh, there were situations where people might need to get to the emergency room. We had to transport them. So agencies spent dollars on protective barriers in vehicles so that we had safety in protecting people and we could get them where they needed to go. By June, we were, piv we were moving out of the um, more telehealth uh, stage um, and back into face-to-face -face because we recognized the importance of face-to-face -face contact. Uh, people were, uh, we began to see the effects of the isolation, the anxiety that increased. And so um, our workforce, while, while we learn more about COVID and how to stay safe and as we social distanced and began to experience that we were okay and we weren't contracting the virus, our staff was feeling more comfortable there. So, um, so you know, we did move back into the community and in order to have space and safety, um, there were uh, agencies that bought tents, um, that uh, got heaters to be able to sit outside if it was cold. Um, and um, that supported some of the folks, particularly on the DS side, developmental services side of our agency to be able to come out of those family living situations. We did make payments to, as Monica, Commissioner uh, Hutt mentioned, to shared living providers, home care providers, crisis stipends for family providers. We bought supplies to deliver to homes during the time when people were most isolated and delivered those, um, just leaving them outside, talking to people from the sidewalk, uh, everything we can to make that contact was extremely important. Um, what we also uh, saw, and I really wanna raise, and uh, that was a new feature for us all, were the amount of people living in hotels. Um, within our state now, our homeless population, as I'm sure many of you know, have received vouchers to be safely housed within hotels. In Washington County, 346 people have vouchers, 80 of those are children. Um, one, one very good positive that came out of that are uh, community providers working together, case managers coming together to provide supports to those people that are in hotels. They have significant needs, case management needs, nursing needs, on-site support, security needed in the hotels, uh, and all of them, all of them have housing needs. So this lies before us as a major challenge um, and we did not receive additional dollars for case management, uh, except through a HOP grant we had for about eight weeks, um, a housing opportunity grant. And some of that went out to our capstone, our community action folks as well. That was very helpful. Um, but we stretched our people and they, they willingly um, have gone door to door in the hotels to provide services. We continue to have the need for a solve there as uh, we come out of the pandemic, I, we're gonna, I'm sure all be talking about that and the services um, that, that are needed um, there. Um, the, um, th that brings me to what we, what we need really um, as we go into the, we're still in the pandemic, but we're getting vaccines. That's the good news. Um, those are beginning. And so our staff is uh, experiencing that. Um, and we are also beginning to see the explosion in mental health needs. So I was on two calls yesterday, today, yesterday and today with executive directors and uh, people are pouring through our doors. I think COVID stress, um, let's acknowledge national stress, um, that hurts our hearts, all of us, and um, it embeds itself in our emotions. And so um, we're seeing uh, people come through and referred from private providers because they believe we could give a greater um, menu of services. We have capacity issues. So um, we are seeing the need for more clinicians. We are seeing the need accentuated for more nursing. COVID really accentuated that for us. Um, clinical needs for our developmental services um, divisions where we do a lot of support, but people, as has been mentioned, with isolation are now having uh, the addition of mental health um, needs through anxiety, um, depression. And so uh, we definitely um, are going to want to talk more about with our department, 
uh, uh, Commissioner Squirrel has mentioned this about the capacity needs for children and adults um, that are going to be increasing. Um, and we, we hope to keep you apprised of that. And of course, in order to meet that capacity, there is an implicit uh, match of market rate salaries that has to be considered. And we're learning that although we have people coming through the doors, they are uh, for staff potentially, they're refusing jobs because of the pay. So um, we'll, we'll need to tackle all of that as we go forward. Um, in, in the post pandemic surge of mental health need. But I think we just really want to conclude um, by expressing our gratitude to our state partners uh, and to all of you on how this was managed thus far and how we will continue to do that going forward together. So thank you so much. Wow, wow. thank you. Uh, thank you, Heidi, uh, Julie and Mary. It, it, it seems to me it's two steps forward and one step backward, and we're going to solve this problem. Uh, we look forward to hearing from you as we um, tackle the, the salary issue, the workforce issue, and all the needs that are out in our communities. Uh, we're all feeling it, and we appreciate the work that you're doing on this. So thank you. Thank and, you, Senator. Thank you uh, all. I, we're just going to move ahead. It's not because it's on, you're, <laughs> there aren't a thousand questions, but uh, we want to hear from everyone. So uh, we're going to move right along to Jill Mazza Olson. And uh, Jill, you are here. I know we let you in a minute ago or a little, little while ago. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. And thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. Um, good morning. I'm Jill Mazza Olson, and I am the executive director of the VNAs of Vermont. So I represent home health and hospice agencies. Um, so I'm gonna try to um, <laughs> give you back a little bit of your time because I know you have lots of witnesses. Um, uh, first of all, just wanna echo what some of the speakers before me had said about the, just our gratitude for all the partnership in Vermont across administration providers and the legislature. I think it's um, our successes in Vermont relative to other places on this crisis are, are not an accident and really due to that, to that capacity for collaboration. Um, in terms of home health agencies, I always like to, especially since there are new legislators, just remind people what we do um, before I launch in, <laughs> because I find that people either know all about us or don't know anything. Um, it seems to be kind of a, a one or the other. Um, we provide uh, several really critical buckets of services. So we provide healthcare at home. That's nurses, physical therapists, occupational therapists at home uh, for people either coming out of the hospital or who have needs that are identified by their physicians. So that's clinical care, skilled care in, in the home where pe most people really prefer it um, where it's possible. Second um, uh, really big bucket is long-term care at home. So people who would otherwise be in nursing homes are able to receive personal services at home, uh, help with um, nutrition, with bathing, dressing, those kinds of things. So it's not skilled care, it's not generally provided by nurses, um, but it is provided in the home and, and keeps lots of people independent at home. And in Vermont, we have about half of our long-term care Medicaid population is actually at home uh, being served by um, by either agencies or by individual providers. Uh, then, then we provide hospice services, so end of life services. And I always say hospice is a service, not a place. So hospice services are provided at home. They're provided uh, in hospitals. They're provided in nursing homes. So we provide hospice services in, in many, um, many settings. And then we also provide um, maternal child health is the other sort of really large bucket. So just a reminder of who we are and what we do. In terms of our um, coronavirus relief funds, um, home health agencies, about 60% of their revenue comes from Medicare. And so as a result, we actually did get some um, allocations from uh, directly from the federal government, which I, it looks to me from just looking at Sarah's data, like the result may have been uh, that none of my agencies in the end qualified for the state funds. I didn't actually see home health listed as recipients. Frankly, Sarah would know better than I would. I did not collect that data knowing that AHS would know uh, more about that than, than I ever, uh, ever could. Um, but we certainly received federal dollars. 
Um, as Commissioner Hutt said, we actually didn't really uh, slow down that much for other, unlike other providers. So the services we provide really don't stop for, for almost anything. And so most things kept going, uh, certainly some exceptions. Um, and certainly when hospitals stopped doing elective surgeries, there was then a, um, you know, that, that sort of flowed through the system where there were fewer people coming out of hospitals who needed our services. At the same time, as hospitals uh, closed down things like outpatient physical therapy, some of that shifted home. So in the end, a lot of my members are actually reporting higher census than, be than the, since before the pandemic started. I'm actually recollecting their, their data to see just what that looks like. But we did not have that, that concern that many providers experienced of loss of um, revenue from not providing care. We did have loss of revenue from fundraising events that were all canceled. And for home health, many agencies plan to lose money on patient care and make up the difference on fundraising. So that is not a small thing for the fundraising to go away. Um, it appears that the federal dollars um, now are allowed to replace lost fundraising revenue. That, that's new. So uh, the rules just keep changing. <laughs> so it's really hard to know. Um, in terms of how we use the federal dollars we received, um, really it was, I mean, there are, you're only allowed to do two things, expenses related to coronavirus or lost revenue. So for us as others, it's largely PPE was the, was the really new big expense. Um, and in terms of what I'd want you to just know about going forward, um, the first is that Medicare is um, penalizing home health agencies when we provide some of our services via telehealth. So I would have to explain to you more than you ever wanted to know about how our federal payments work um, to give you the details, which I'm not going to do today. Um, but, but suffice it to say, if we provide, uh, we, we provide care in episodes, so we take care of people for 30 days, no matter how many visits they need, that's how we get paid. If some of them are telehealth, it substantially reduces the total payment. Um, so it's really, we view it as a penalty for providing some of those services by telehealth. And some of them can be provided that way, especially for a, a subsequent PT visit, you might be able to do some that way. So that's a federal problem. We're trying to solve it federally. And of course, we have a very supportive delegation um, behind us to, to assist. And then as others have said, um, this crisis has created a, a workforce crisis on top of a workforce crisis. So we started with a workforce crisis across all areas of our service, uh, long-term care and skilled services, and it is worse. In some places, substantially worse. Any agency that was relying on contracted traveling nurses from um, uh, those kinds of programs, they're, they're already very expensive, but now they're not even available. They're in, they've been deployed all over the country. So um, that has created really substantial workforce um, challenges in the nursing ar arena for some of my agencies. So that, you know, when I think about what's keeping us up at night, um, you know, I mean, other than the global pandemic, it's, uh, it's, it's workforce. And it is, it's always workforce, but it's even that much more challenging. And um, so that's our top priority in terms of, um, you know, where we, we're going to need additional help moving forward. I think that covers the, the primary comments that I, I thought might be helpful to you today. Thank you, uh, that, that is very helpful. And uh, we will be following through with uh, some of the issues that you've talked about, I'm sure. So we, we greatly appreciate your time. Thank yes. you. Thank you very much. Okay. And um, so we're, we're gonna move right along and we'll move right on to John Sales who is here from the Vermont Food Bank. And John, thank you for being here. I'll just unmute myself so people won't have to say, you're muted. Uh, hi, everybody. Thank you for having me. And uh, I appreciate the time today. For the record, I'm John Sales. I'm CEO at the Vermont Food Bank. Um, yeah, as I said, thank you for really the, the incredible work um, above and beyond that the, the legislature and the 
the administration and you know all of our partners in the community have done um, to address the pandemic and the economic implications. Um, we've been really grateful for the support um, and policies and funding to help our neighbors facing hunger. Uh, as the food bank plans for the year ahead, we know that the hunger crisis we're facing is not going away. As Julie Tesler said, this wave has yet to crest. Um, one in three Vermonters right now um, have faced hunger or food insecurity since the pandemic began. And, um, you know, as we know, this is far from over. Uh, addressing the increased need um, with so much help from so many places, the food bank has doubled our distribution since March, dramatically increasing purchasing from local farms, uh, providing funding to support community partners throughout the state. Um, and all the while taking all the, the measures necessary to make sure that that staff and volunteers and the people we serve remain safe and healthy. Um, I just on the on the CARES Act funding, um, huge appreciation, the, the legislature and the administration supported $4.7 million in funding to the Vermont Food Bank. And uh, all of that um, has been spent and we have um, have gotten reimbursement up through the end of November so far. And so still calculating the December numbers um, and well, um, great working with the Agency of Human Services. They've been a great partner in this uh, to make this all move smoothly. Just, just in really broad strokes, how that money was spent, uh, about 632,000 of that was spent on salaries um, operating, including the purchase of food, uh, about 3 million of that 4.7, uh, about 2.6 million was spent on food and other necessities, things like diapers and cleaning supplies. Uh, sub grants to our network partners, the food shelves and, and meal sites right in all of your communities. Um, and in addition to some other, uh, some other groups, uh, folks like the diaper bank and uh, uh, NOFA Vermont for their low income CSA program was about $580,000. Um, and then a miscellaneous kind of indirect of about 400,000. Uh, and, you know, just one example of, of the impact of the coronavirus that we got an email or there was a front porch forum post from the Worcester food shelf here in central Vermont. In the first quarter of 19, January, February, March, they served 83 families, and that was 212 uh, people, individuals. By that last quarter of 19, they were serving 513 families and 1,160 people. Um, and, you know, this is in addition to the Farmers to Families Food Box Program and the, you know, all the other uh, food assistance that's happening, your local food shelves and your communities are responding in an amazing way. And we're, we're really proud to, to be a partner in their network, as well as uh, with so many other partners in the community. Um, really, we want to keep people ready to bounce back from this and not to have to dig out. And in order to help accomplish that um, uh, in foreshadowing what Representative Leppard said earlier, um, I'd like to just talk about some different ways that the state can continue to provide support uh, around food for people in the community heading into 2021. Um, one, one request, there's three, uh, is to allocate 1.5 million of the remaining CARES Act funding to the extent that there's funding uh, remaining to support the Vermont Farmers to Families Food Box Program, which the food bank um, has, along with the Abbey Group, has implemented. It's it's working right now. We'll be doing eight weeks of of boxes, five uh, five hundred boxes a a day, five days a week for eight weeks, and those contain more than half Vermont product. Uh, it will allow us to bridge the gap and complement the USDA program, which is starting up again in February. The second is is uh, we'll be before the legislature asking again this year for a $500,000 appropriation, annual appropriation for Vermonters feeding Vermonters. 
um, where the, the program purchases the local food from Vermont farmers and growers and distributes that to our neighbors who wouldn't otherwise be able to afford that food. Uh, because of the, the CARES Act funding, the, the food bank had had a, a budget of $200,000 for purchasing local foods in the, this last year. Uh, we were able to spend $975,000 supporting local Vermont farms all over the state. Uh, we did submit testimony and some materials and includes a map that shows where all those farms are so you can see where they are in your communities. And finally, should more federal funding become available, um, to the state to, to allocate out. Um, the food bank um, does have uh, a budget of about $7 million uh, for, uh, for additional costs that, that we project will be incurring in the fiscal year of 2021 for the food bank. That includes that 1.5 million that I mentioned earlier. Um, we know that NOR funds are not available yet, but um, and we're ready to to come in when that process begins and and have uh, further conversations and kind of break that down for you. Um, just thank you sincerely for for all the work you're doing um, under really uh, incredible stress and really difficult circumstances. And um, I'm I'm so proud, as others have said, about the partnerships that have. Uh, we're always there, but really, really have taken off all across the state. And my one hope for our learning through this uh, this time is that is that we don't let that go away, that those silos don't get built back up, and that we continue to really support each other um, through this and into the future. Thank you. John, thank you. Uh, we we uh, do know how committed you are to uh, avoiding food insecurity in our state. And we really appreciate the work that you've done. Um, uh, you know, and I, I can't thank everyone enough, uh, all, everyone who's on the call today uh, for their work that they're doing. Um, I do, here's, here's something that we need, we are under a lot of stress. And so I think uh, two things. First, we will go until 1130. I've talked with communicated with both chairs and that seems to fit with co uh, committee schedules. But if we're gonna do that, I think that we need to take a five minute break and we're doing that right now. <laughs> and, and I don't apologize to the witnesses because I'll bet you all need a little break too. So we'll be back here at 1042. Thank you. Nellie, you can put the screen up for about five minutes. Anne, are you there? Well, I'm sorry, I went off video. I didn't realize. Yep, I'm yeah, here. no, we were. We were off video. I just want to uh, bring us back. Yes. Mm -hmm. Oh, terrific. OK, Nelly, uh, Nelly brought us back. Good. Mm -hmm. I, I was talking before, and I was on mute. I just didn't know I wasn't getting any responses. Uh, so listen, thank you all for um, coming back in together. And uh, we'll, we'll continue on with our testimony. and. We have Allie Richards, who is Chief Executive Officer for Let's Grow Kids, uh, and certainly uh, an area of concern during COVID. So Allie, why don't you go ahead with your testimony? Thank you so much, Senator. And uh, for the record, Allie Richards, CEO of Let's Grow Kids. And again, an honor to be here. And I appreciate you asking for an overview from our perspective. And it's just stunning to hear the response from everyone so far. Unbelievable. And I, like everyone else, will start with gratitude. Um, I also submitted testimony and we also submitted a summary of where the CRF dollars went for childcare. So if that's of help for folks to go into detail, um, a reminder and for those who are new, Let's Grow Kids is a campaign for high quality, affordable childcare for all who need it in Vermont by 2025. And we really act as a facilitator. So I'm here in that vein today to give you an overview. Uh, while we don't do direct service, we do work directly with the field of early educators and childcare programs um, so I'm, I'm here to give you a quick overview of how the CRF dollar response went um, in that regard. And like everyone else, the, the punchline is truly remarkable, truly remarkable. I think you all know, you set a national standard for how to respond um, in this crisis, specifically for childcare. Um, and so in, in what I submitted to you all are sort of the details of where those dollars went, $50 million in relation to child care and early childhood education in some manner. So um, 
again, what I think we need to really emphasize, and I don't think I'm putting in too strong terms, the support, the swiftness and thoughtfulness and target, targeted support really avoided an utter disaster for the childcare industry. We are in a much stronger position for this essential but fragile industry than almost any other state because of the support. Uh, specifically, the, the, the targeted monies went to uh, early childhood education programs. First, as you'll remember, the stabilization program, which helped childcare programs implement health and safety guidelines during the very early days of the pandemic, ensure that programs would be able to reopen uh, since they weren't going to go financially bankrupt once this closure period was over. They also went to restart stipends. That allowed programs to prepare to welcome children and families back into their care after the closure period, responsibly at their own pace, to source PPE that they needed, cleaning supplies, and other elements like that. Additionally, the supports for early child education programs included the operational relief grants. Those helped programs account for lost income, due to the small class sizes with the public health guidelines, increased staffing needs for the protocols, additional supplies and other increased expenses to do this already very difficult task within the context of a pandemic. So those were the targeted supports that went to the early education programs. Similarly, you really helped families directly through the support. Essential workers were able to access emergency care during the closure period because pro some programs were supported to stay open for essential workers' children. The Child Care Financial Assistance Program continued to pay uh, programs when children were not attending, so paid upon enrollment and not attendance. That was very significant in allowing families who weren't able to pay remaining tuition, able to ask, access support from the state and continue to hold their child care space. And also the temporary child care hubs, which allowed families with school age children to access, access care during the remote learning days. So again, a span of things that really targeted supports to families when they needed it the most. Finally, early childhood educators got directed supports through this, through mostly the frontline workers hazard pay program and the workforce stabilization program, which provided one time financial support and recognition of the difficult work that these early educators were doing. And Many of them were working since the beginning of the pandemic, you know, for quite small pay and no benefits. So this was an unbelievable part of the response where early educators were receiving literal wage supports at the end of the year to help them carry on, you know, keep doing this work, keep showing up for their kids and families, in some cases pay for their health care, um, since some don't have that benefit during the, the crisis. So those were the supports. They're summarized in the documents that I sent. You know, I, I want to be clear. This was an unbelievable response. The field is incredibly grateful from our discussions with them. Um, I don't wanna to make too, too rosy pictures so it doesn't seem unrealistic. Yes, there were a few bumps along the road but they were very relatively modest and minor considering the scope of this response. As you heard from Sarah Clark, it's just really unbelievable the amount of detail um, that and money that went out the door here. Uh, almost all the bumps were related to process just some prolonged timelines, waiting to hear on some details. Uh, some were just, uh, uh, frankly, the level of detail needed. Um, and almost all of that was due to federal guidelines that we had to meet. So it was quite understandable. Um, and again, these were really relatively modest um, concerns that, that happened. And I will also say a lot of them directly relate back to a very antiquated IT system. Having that really did um, you know, tie one hand behind our backs for the response. And I think a lot of folks are committed uh, to really fixing that moving forward. So, I'll just add relative two very, very short additional notes. Um, as we sit here, as you heard from so many folks already on this call, uh, we are in the middle still of a crisis that is uh, unembedded at the moment, although we have light at the end of the tunnel. So a lot of these supports have run out and childcare continues uh, to show up every day for these kids and families in this essential way. We have the $12.5 million additional from the feds. So we're very excited and awaiting next steps and details from the feds on that. And very much looking forward to working uh, together with you all as the next wave here with that $12.5 million and how to target that. Um, also, as we know, we risk going back as we come out of this acute crisis to an unsustainable and equitable system. Uh, we know everyone is working together collectively and committed um, to the future, and I feel quite optimistic about this. Um, you know, 
really tackling together as we move forward, access, affordability, and quality, these structural issues that we must still address. Um, as we know, we won't fix any of these without um, really diving into them together. So that's the IT infrastructure, continuing to make progress on CCFAP and supports for the early education workforce. So I really do want to end by saying this is again a brief overview to give you a sense of a truly remarkable and and national leader response for child care in vermont um the field feels incredibly grateful on balance of how this all went that these were very targeted and they frankly made a huge difference in allowing this fragile and essential industry to stay as it needed to thank you very much ali thank you uh we do have your uh written comments and the data of uh, uh, financial data. So we, we very much appreciate that. Our, um, our committees, the uh, Human Services and Health and Welfare in the Senate will be working, um, House Human Services, uh, will be working together on childcare issues. So it will be important for us to have this feedback. Okay. Um, and I want, I want to keep moving along and uh, I'm going to need help uh, from Jacob and uh, I don't know how to pronounce your name. Thought, is it Thato or and, uh, I'm going to ask you to pronounce your name for me, please. So I don't um, make a mess of it. And are you two uh, testifying together or separately? Thank you so much for having us. Thato and I will be testifying together. Uh, oh, Tato is uh, the Associate Director of uh, the Association of Africans Living in Vermont. Uh, and would you like to introduce yourself as well? Yes. Uh, okay. I'm Yakuba Jacob Bogre, and I am uh, the Executive Director of uh, the Association of Africans Living in Vermont. Uh, good morning. My name is Tato Ratzebe, and I'm the Associate Director. I'm very pleased to be here. Thank you for having us. Well, we're pleased to have you here. Uh, and why don't we allow for you to testify? Um, please go right ahead. Thank you so much for having us and giving us the opportunity to share about uh, the work we did uh, over the past uh, few months. It has been uh, very difficult for not our organization, but our communities, but also as a community here in Vermont. We were fortunate enough to have the support of legislatures like you. And uh, in mid-July, uh, when uh, Mary Beth uh, reached out to inquire about what we, how we are doing, uh, also how we would like to see the legislature support our work, we were really uh, we were relieved to, under, to hear that uh, help is on the way. And uh, what I'm going to cover is, uh, talking more about uh, what we received from the legislature here, our organization received 350,000. So we'll talk about uh, what we did with this funding, speak a little bit about our organization and the core services we are offering, and also look at uh, ways to cover some of the needs that are not met. With me, Tato would also share some of the slides that we are going to talk about. So we, on that note, I will uh, let that start with for the overview of our core services, and also I will continue with the rest of uh, the presentation. I was muted. <laughs> you were you were muted. <laughs> well. We thought we could uh, start by giving you an overview of what uh, the organization does for the benefit of uh, people who may be fa not familiar with our work. Uh, so the organization serves refugees and immigrants who have uh, come to the state of Vermont after their initial stages of uh, resettlement. So we provide services uh, from whenever folks come into our doors until uh, uh, people feel self-sufficient. Uh, our model of service is to work uh, with the community to empower them to eventually have the ability to access other services uh, without our hand-holding. Uh, that varies 
uh, depending on family situations, depending on individual situations. So we provide what we call the wraparound case management services, where people come in and we figure out what they need help with. It goes anywhere from figuring out the mail, primarily from a state, uh, to understand uh, how systems work, where people can access services, we also provide the interpreter and translation services. Uh, we, uh, so with interpreter and translation services, uh, uh, our partners, uh, pro, uh, they submit requests and then we train and uh, launch interpreters out to help uh, with uh, communication in, in other settings. We also have the health and behavior programs where we do primarily education around substance abuse, uh, uh, sexual education for, for young people. We also have support groups for women who were primarily uh, sexually abused while they were in refugee camps or while they were running from one refugee camp to the next or trying to find safety. Uh, we call those groups uh, community cafes. Uh, we also have legal services uh, that provides uh, primarily immigration legal services. Uh, so when uh, refugees come here, they are technically a permanent residents, but at some point you have to apply for a green card uh, and uh, as well as apply to be naturalized as a citizen after five years, if you choose to do so. We provide all these services for free. Uh, we have workforce development where we work with folks to look for work. We do training in terms of how to work in, in, in the US and then uh, we work with companies uh, locally to, uh, to, to help folks look for work. We have uh, our garden program called the New Farms for New Americans. Uh, a lot of folks grow food in the summer uh, for primarily home consumption. Uh, it's one of the popular programs uh, among the community because people come from uh, agriculture background. So it's been wonderful to have the space to be able to grow our home food. So if you ever have the time during the summer and want to see a variety of crops, please do visit uh, AELV's New Farms for New Americans. We have the youth development program that has grown tremendously. And over this, uh, this pandemic, actually, it proved to be such a great need where uh, kids came in the office and we continued to support their uh, education efforts by uh, providing tutoring and helping them understand uh, the, the education system because parents were not in a position to, to do so. Uh, we also have the Rich Up uh, Case Management Program, which is supported by the state. Uh, I said all this very quickly. I'm sure I'm leaving one or two things, but I just wanted to give you that quick overview. Thank you. Thank you, Tato. When we reached out uh, to the state, our hope was to provide uh, with our grant uh, the following work, communicate uh, with our community and provide linguistically appropriate health and uh, hygiene information related, COVID, related to COVID-19, deliver care packages to families that are in need of support, provide the case management, and also ensure that new Americans can continue to access uh, <clears throat> services safely within our organization and also get the right referral to programs or uh, support they need if we cannot do that in-house. The next slide you have here give you a breakdown of what we did over the past six months. It's somehow small, but uh, one of the, the things that is at the top is uh, social security. Now, some of our participants receive SSI benefits because, of, uh, because they are elderly or they are disabled. And uh, as you know, some of these uh, require continuous uh, updates or uh, feeling more paperwork. And sometimes when folks get into this country, they, are, they could be eligible for SSI, but they need to adjust or become citizen within the first seven years of arrival in the United States. So for individuals who are eligible to apply for citizenship, we work closely with them and the medical providers to make sure that they can get the medical waiver and assist with uh, the citizenship application so they don't lose this benefit that is crucial to supporting their need. One of the things we also helped over the past summer is employment. 
between March and July, we have seen a lot of clients coming here because they lost their job. So they needed help navigating the Department of Labor system, filing for unemployment, or looking for employment opportunity. In our case, we work closely with employers to first ensure that uh, clients could go back to work if they were given the opportunity once uh, the employers reopened their workplace. And uh, on a weekly basis, we're filing about 158 applications for unemployment. Reaching out to the Department of Labor just to make sure that folks are getting their benefits and also troubleshooting if information were missing. And now uh, we were really grateful with our Department of Labor here because they were able to triage, give us a portal where we could just upload information of clients who are struggling to access their benefit. And this helped us cut down on uh, the wait time over the phone or uh, making sure that folks are not missing on their benefits. And this has been really helpful until uh, the end of the year, we continue this system. So one of the biggest uh, things also pertain to navigating healthcare and also assisting clients access uh, services, mainly general assistance and legal assistance. One of the things we ran into earlier is folks being asked to pay back because there were claims that were not found to be legitimate. So we work closely with uh, the Vermont Legal Aid and the South Royalton Legal Clinic to triage clients who were receiving notices to pay back so they can help us navigate uh, this system with the Department of Labor. By the end of the year, we referred uh, 12 cases to the Department of Labor and three of them were waived. So clients were able to see 32,375 waived for these three participants because employers were refusing to acknowledge that the workplace has closed and sometimes they were pretending that uh, they reach out to employees to come back and they refuse to come back. And uh, the rest of the cases are still pending. And we are hopeful that uh, with the support of uh, Vermont Legal Aid and uh, the South Royalton Legal Clinic, we'll be able to help our clients uh, make their case and uh, avoid paying the fees and the penalties. And the rest of the services uh, here, you will see one of the things that pertains to the women group. One of the, the activity we did during this summer is to run focus group to help understand the needs of the community and also see how we can be proactive. Between March and July, we were completely closed, providing services online. But this was proven to be difficult because sometimes clients would walk to case manager's house and wait outside for services. So as of July 6, we reopened for in-person meeting in the office, and we did so until the end of the year. That's okay, we'll move to the next slide, please. And uh, on this slide, you will see the number of clients we met with uh, per, per month. At the beginning of the program in July, about 273. We saw a dip in uh, August, usually during the summer month, and during this time also, we were fully open and services, services were more accessible. Many folks were able to go back to work. So we have seen a dip in uh, the number of clients we assisted. But starting September, the number again went up after the holiday period, 328 in September. October, we saw a decline, 278. November, 242. And December, we were at 395 clients we met with during this period. But we had to close our office uh, mid-December to give some time to our staff to rest because folks have been working uh, non-stop between March and uh, December and uh, folks, we were so burned. So we decided to close for at least two weeks so people can uh, rest and uh, come back in uh, January. We wanted to share some of the numbers we uh, some of the cases we worked on during this pandemic. Uh, weekly, we filed 158 uh, in employment uh, insurance claim with for the Department of Labor. This was case managers helping clients who were on uh, in employment call weekly to file their uh, claims. And usually client, uh, staff would start Sunday through Thursday to make sure that everyone claims is filed. We were able to submit 74 uh, application for the rental stabilization program, 103 for the utility assistance program, 
and 38 individuals were referred to other agencies. These are folks or services that we could not provide in house. So some of them pertain to domestic violence situation, mental health, homelessness, and as I said earlier, uh, appealing some of uh, the decision from the Department of Labor, asking clients to pay when uh, there were some uh, mistake on uh, their payment. And with our partner here in the building, the family room, we work closely to make sure that we do not duplicate services because sometimes some of the clients who attend the family room programs are the same coming to ALV. So what we did is uh, working with them to provide food assistance to the clients and also care packages. So the family room and us work closely with some of the farmers and the local stores to collect donated goods and food. And we pay the care packages ranging from diapers to toiletries. So we would make boxes and uh, bring that to families that are in need. And usually we would identify families the week before. So the following week, we can have them on our list and uh, do the delivery when uh, they were asking for assistance. Between July and September, 26 individuals came to our office for employment assistance and we were able to help 24 of them find a job at 13.75 per hour. And the numbers seem low, but to remember that not everyone who was laid off was um, had to look for a job because some of them were able to go back when the employers reopened their workplace. And we kept in touch with most of the employers just to make sure that we understand when they were opening and also what are some of the needs so we can communicate that back to the clients we, who were working with them and make sure that they can safely return back to work and follow some of the guidance that uh, the employers were, uh, was uh, sharing with them. And the following quarter also, October to December, the number went up to 52 and 42 were able to find a job at uh, a reduced rate, this time $12.75 per hour. So we are still continuing but as of December and the beginning of this year, the number of folks are being laid off is increasing. So it is our hope that we will be able to assist them as much as we can and also get back uh, to the employer to see if they would be willing to take them when they reopen uh, soon. Thanks, Jacob. Uh, before uh, we, we end our presentation, we also just wanted to uh, um, uh, talk a little bit about the positive out of uh, the, the crisis that we are in. Uh, we tend to take the, 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 the positive outlook uh, from every crisis that we go through uh, within our building. Um, when when uh, COVID-19 hit in March, uh, we knew that it was going to be very challenging, more especially for folks with limited English proficiency. The anxiety went up right away. So we had to quickly think on our feet on, you know, what's the best way to reach out to folks so they know that we are still available. Technology use is, is uh, definitely a challenge and we were worried about that. However, we are able to adapt very quickly to uh, a service called WhatsApp that I think now most providers in Vermont are learning about uh, because they have to serve the refugee population. And so everybody sort of moved to that. We, we had uh, existing groups for WhatsApp that we tend to do, um, uh, broadcast, we tend to broadcast message uh, through that application. So we uh, got in touch with clients right Way we explained uh, what was going on, we 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 pushed the the message to educate people about COVID nineteen because there was so much mis uh, information that was inaccurate coming from our home countries, coming from other refugee camps. Uh, so we wanted to make sure that in fact uh, Vermonters here, uh, the LEP community, knew the same information that everyone else knew. So the collaboration uh, between uh, USCRI, otherwise known as VRRP, uh, the Spectrum Youth and Family Services, we quickly got together and formed a multilingual task force where we create messages
messages uh, where we uh, translated the Vermonters, uh, the, the governor's messages as they were going on to distribute to the community, just to make sure that everybody was in the loop. The multilingual task force continues under the support of Department uh, of Health. So we are really grateful uh, for that support. We also uh, got into a contract right away with the state for the mass feeding. Uh, most of our folks started testing positive for COVID. Uh, and as you may be aware that uh, families live in small houses. So we were worried about the quarantine. We knew that isolation will be a challenge, but at least we wanted to make sure that the quarantine quarantining rules were understood and we could provide support. So we formed a partnership where the state of Vermont will give us details about who needed help with food. As soon as we got the information, we went to do food purchasing, we deliver the food. The service continues today. Uh, it's a logistical nightmare, but the one that I think we have perfected now. Uh, uh, so folks can uh, adequately quarantine uh, and still have food in the home because that was, uh, the most worry for parents that if we have to stay for 14 days, how are our kids going to eat? Uh, so we also uh, really, I think, strengthened collaboration out of this. Uh, you know, the, everybody has been saying this. I, I always say that Vermont is my home away from home. Uh, we got phone calls. People were saying, what is it that we can do to support you? We have plenty of masks because we opened services in full, people were coming into the, uh, the office. It was crucial that we make sure that uh, we were safe in the office uh, and we were keeping everyone safe. We had the masks, sanitizers were donated, uh, food donations, uh, uh, volunteers came in when people became homeless and then we found housing, we had to move them. People were willing to literally volunteer and help us move families in their new homes. So that was really uplifting for us. It, it was one of the times where we said, we are in the right place. Vermont is the place to live. So we are very, very grateful for that. And I'll just touch uh, a couple, for a couple of minutes on the gaps, existing gaps that uh, we continue to, uh, to see. I don't know how to remove uh, my slide. Uh, if I can get some help doing so, that will be great. Otherwise, maybe, uh, I think, um, hang on, I can, maybe I can do it. Um, I can stop the share. Thank yeah, you. there you go. That's it. We did it. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, I just wanted to highlight a few gaps uh, that uh, continue to exist. I, I talk about the gaps, but I also really want to let all of you know that without the support that you gave us, we could have lost the staff at AELV. The, the, our situation could have looked very different. Uh, so the CRF funding really came at the right time for us to have the ability to continue supporting services to folks who would otherwise really struggle accessing uh, services in general. So we are very grateful for that gesture. It was timely. We just cannot say thank you enough. Um, our major source of income is one of the programs that I, I mentioned, the interpreting services. As soon as uh, COVID hit, we saw a decline in the uh, requests. So that meant that 27% of our uh, uh, income, which is more operational income. So our interpreter services um, uh, supplements all our salaries, Jacob, myself, everyone else. So we had to make some adjustment as soon as that happened. Uh, fortunately for us, we have incredibly dedicated staff. Everyone was ready to continue working regardless. So, uh, so that created uh, a gap in terms of our ability to increase the staff. Uh, however, uh, what we are able to do with the support that we got was to have an additional staff member who was able to reach out to the other community, the Bemis community. We have had a gap in providing services to the Bemis community because we couldn't afford to add one more body. So we are able to achieve that and uh, be able to do home outreach for the community. So that was uh, very uh, helpful. So the, the gaps that continue to exist really is the ability to operate at the same level as we would like to, uh, because long-term we, we, without uh, 
staff in resource, we cannot uh, afford to uh, provide services at the level that we are doing right now. Uh, the staff uh, is fatigued. Uh, we gave everyone time off at Christmas. Jacob and I had to work. We can never ever close the office completely. So I cannot wait for a week where I can take vacation. <laughs> I'm ready for that. And, and I know that it, it will happen because we have incredible collaborators around the state. Uh, I think one of the things that uh, we see as an opportunity, it's a gap, but also an opportunity. It's really this idea that we now are at a place where we are collaborating as organizations. Vermont Land, uh, the cultural brokers, USCRI. We see this as an opportunity for us to continue growing and working together to leverage the already limited resources that we have in the state. Uh, that also requires a lot of cross training. Uh, we see ALV as an opportunity to work together to cross train so that we can empower each other as organizations with knowledge because we bring something, we can learn something from other organizations as well. Uh, in, 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 with the intentions to provide adequate services to our communities. So we hope that you know, with further support, we can have an opportunity to, uh, to cross train, to increase our staffing, uh, as well as uh, the, one of the biggest thing is of course, accessible, uh, access to stable housing. Uh, there is just not enough housing in Vermont. And then fo folks are struggling to Hey, the housing is very expensive. So that remains a gap. Um, access to the court system was such a challenge, is still a challenge uh, during COVID-19. We have domestic violence cases, unfortunately. Uh, we were worried as soon as uh, COVID-19 happened that how are we going to deal with this? Uh, so our hope is that we can increase our uh, collaboration with the courts and then train internally to know how we can continue to support folks while the court system is still figuring out how we can access the courts safely so people can get uh, the services that they need. Um, I had quite a lot to say, but I realized also that uh, uh, the time has moved a little faster. Uh, but we just also wanted to really say thank you again for, for your support. We look forward to the continued collaboration. We appreciate your acknowledgement and recognition of the hard work that our team, I always say is our team doing the groundwork that uh, do all their time to support the new Vermonters to uh, feel like that we are all home away from our original homes. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you both uh, for being here. I was muted, I'm sorry. Um, I just wanna say thank you and thank you both for being here and being so thorough in your presentation. You've touched on a lot of issues that are um, cross currents and relate to other organizations. So that's very helpful. Um, and I'm sure we'll, be hearing from you again. <laughs> uh, I'm going to, I'd like to move on now. We've got, uh, we do have some solid, uh, we have three or four other folks we want to hear from. And so we'll, we'll turn to Holly Morehouse of Vermont After School, then we'll go to the Parent Child Centers, and then to the Coalition of Disability Rights. And I'm going to ask each of the groups that are remaining to be, um, pretty concise and if you have anything in writing we'll we'll refer to that um, rather than take up uh, an, another hour we could spend another three or four days on what we're hearing so thank you and thank you thank everyone for being so patient with us we're we we want to learn as much as we can and we do appreciate your uh, providing information so let's move on uh, Holly um, welcome Thank you. Good morning. Um, I'm Holly Morehouse of Vermont After School. Uh, we are a statewide nonprofit that provides professional development, training, technical assistance, uh, partnership building, and networking uh, for any organizations, after school programs, summer programs, working with children and youth outside the school day and over the summer. Um, this morning, I'm going to report on a very specific initiative, the School Age Child Care Hubs Initiative. I did submit a report 
Um, so you have in that report detailed information on how we ran the process. There is a link to a map of where the hubs were located. There are quotes from staff, parents, and children um, who attended the hubs, and there are further details on where the gaps were in the program and the recommendations um, that I think that we can draw on from these lessons learned over the last few months um, as we move into 2021 uh, and 2022. Um, just to, to give brief context, if you remember late summer, early fall, um, Vermont was facing a potential crisis for working families and young children where the Department of Health felt it was safe for children, elementary school age children to be in school in person, but yet not all of our schools were able to open their doors and um, do in-person uh, classrooms. Um, the uh, parents were, um, we're in crisis thinking about how to return to work um, and meet the childcare needs. And we also felt that children, young children really needed to be back um, with caring adults and in, in supervised and, and active engaging uh, settings. Um, so that is where uh, uh, Governor Scott's initiative and with support from the General Assembly uh, moved forward with the hubs. About $6.9 million were allocated for the hubs. Uh, it went through the Department uh, for Children and Families, the Child Development Division. Uh, Vermont After School was the state uh, lead partner on that and we worked uh, extremely closely uh, together uh, through every step of the way. So the hub grants uh, did garner uh, national attention, this initiative, uh, partly because it happened so quickly. Um, and uh, it was just a matter of, I think, seven or 10 days from when it was announced to when we had the first hub doors open. Uh, it is a, a time where I think we, another spot in this morning where we can uh, take stock and, um, and be proud of what uh, Vermont has accomplished um, since March. I will say um, in looking at why, uh, what worked well, uh, there's three things that I'll really point to. One, it was building on the existing infrastructure the HUBS initiative called on after-school providers, recreation departments, private child care providers, early child care providers to really step into the space. That um, allowed us to move more quickly. It allowed us to create a system that did not draw down on those existing networks and actually ended up with um, stronger supports across our state uh, than when we started. Uh, the second was the strong collaboration uh, with uh, Department for Children and Families, um, Child Development Division, uh, a number of state agencies, um, the dedicated resources that moved into the space to make um, things happen quickly uh, was truly amazing and something that I was really, um, really uh, proud of uh, for our state. And um, the third piece was that around opening the hubs, it was not about just opening spaces and warehousing children. <laughs> it was about finding qualified providers who already had experience working with children and families, following the health and safety guidelines provided by the Department of Health. We had a statewide staff hiring campaign to bring new people to the field. We had extensive training available for staff. We had ongoing coaching and technical assistance uh, because whenever you open a program for children and youth, it needs to be a quality program. Uh, where we saw some of the gaps, uh, the hubs were set up for remote learning days. However, many programs across the state uh, offered extended hours, even though their schools were in session. So elementary school might be in session until 11 or one on any given day. Um, and an after school program had to step in and provide that extended uh, programming. There was no funding through this pro initiative to go to those areas. They had to be on remote learning days. In addition, the uh, grants uh, allowed for startup um, and operating costs for the first month, but did not cover ongoing tuition or fees. Uh, so there was a heavy burden placed on families uh, who were now in the position of providing six to 30 additional hours of childcare for their school-aged children um, without um, sufficient support. The program ended at sixth grade. We heard from another number of families looking for support for middle schoolers in seventh and eighth grade. Um, and um, we also uh, are faced with the hub program only ran through the end of December. So there are a number of schools and communities that were later into the game and didn't have time to apply for hubs and the funding ended in December and we are still looking at hybrid school schedules, remote learning days and there is no support um, continuing um, in those areas. We do know the demand is great. There's about 26,000 children and youth who would be in programs today if more were available and affordable. Uh, we ran a small grant competition with After School for All funds in December 
to try to help meet this need for winter and spring. Uh, we had $110,000. So some of that was state dollars and some of that was from the Vermont Community Foundation. We received 84 uh, proposals with requests totaling over $900,000. So the demand continues to be heavy in our state for programs serving children and youth um, outside the school day and, um, and, pro and communities are ready to do so. For recommendations, I think our biggest lessons learned um, are three. Um, one, when we talk about childcare in our state, we need to talk about not just zero to five, but we also need to pay attention to school age. So I would say elementary school and middle school need places to be when parents are working. Um, any supports uh, that we provide for child care field, uh, we need to have parity uh, for after school programs and staff. Um, and I would also include in that uh, COVID testing and vaccination schedules um, so that child care providers and after school programs can uh, meet the needs of children and families. Um, secondly, the uh, which I briefly addressed was the idea of fees, who pays for this. It's a heavy, heavy burden on families to pick up the additional uh, child care time. Um, so any way that we can use state and federal recovery dollars and in the report I point to three different sources of some of the federal dollars that can be used for after school and summer learning. Which brings me to my third point. Um, when schools had to close their doors um, in the spring it was after school providers and early child care workers who provided that essential care. When schools could not open the doors in the summer or run summer programming it was after school providers who morphed in, and provided summer programming. When schools could not open in the fall, it was after school programs and youth serving organizations that provided the child care hubs on remote learning days. Now, when I look at plans coming from schools um, on how to support students um, in the spring and through the summer, I would love to see after school, summer programs, community partners, youth serving organizations written into every single one of those plans. Um, we are looking at significant learning loss for students and we are also looking at significant emotional social emotional learning, um, uh, connection, loneliness, um, and, and youth engagement needs and after school position, uh, programs are well positioned to support those. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your support. Um, and I will pass back the mic. Well, we know that uh, we know that our committees will be working on child care issues and this fits directly in with that. And I know that the, so it'll be a We'll be seeing you again, Holly, and thank you very much uh, for the work that you did and for all the information that we now have on, on our web pages. So thank you. Um, so we're gonna, we're gonna switch over to parent child centers and uh, Amy Schillenberger has asked uh, some folks to testify for us. And I, what I'm gonna ask actually is that we have both Donna Bailey and Mary Feldman. And if there's a way that, um, are, are you folks testifying together? Or no. were you, I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. Uh, I think we're testifying separately. Okay, and uh, just so you know that um, we're, our goal is to finish up within 10 or 15 minutes. So our time is very precious. And we do have uh, Vermont Disability Rights who we also wanna hear from. And if we, if we miss something and we'll, we're, we're sure to have you back. No, <laughs> we're, we don't wanna miss uh, the testimony that you have prepared for us. So thank you. Uh, so am I going? Yes. Go right ahead. Go ahead. Okay. So hi, and thank you for hanging in there this long. I appreciate the extra time. I promise you I will be under four minutes. So it's always good to know how long you're gonna deal with somebody. Uh, my name is Mary Feldman and I'm the executive director of the Rutland County Parent Child Center. And I really do appreciate this opportunity to share with you the good news of the work that you have accomplished as a state legislature uh, through, the, through the agencies that you have supported. Um, we have been able to use those funds to respond to the needs of Vermont families who utilize the extensive services provided by the statewide network of parent child centers. We're grateful for the specific amount of $1,621,000 and one cents. So thank you. Um, we can all agree that we've come through tough and unprecedented times. And yet with the resilience of the human spirit, you have responded. The parent child centers have responded and our communities have felt their needs acknowledged during very scary times. 
the end in sight feels to some of us quite a ways away, especially when things return to normal, there will be a, a big cleanup. So again, thank you for your work, which helped us to respond to uh, the individual parent child center community needs across the state. COVID provided a new landscape for the work we do. I'm sure you can relate. Um, it might be hard to imagine how life changed for the ordinary community citizen uh, in person. Suddenly, food shopping was both unaffordable and inaccessible. Parent child centers responded with food for children and families who were suddenly unemployed and suddenly unable to take care of the immediate needs of their families. Food insecurity is a very humbling concept and a stressful experience was mitigated by the funding provided by the state through parent child centers. Rutland County Parent Child Center mobilized its forces and was able to provide food on level with what we at our agency consider to be our own little national guard in Rutland on an ongoing basis. 45,000 meal equivalents have been delivered to Rutland County families on a monthly basis. Your funding provided the refrigeration and freezer units to provide these foods safely. The purchase of tents helped this to be accomplished in a warm and safe environment for staff and recipients alike. Many parent child centers across the state were able to provide food because of CRF funding. For many folks, COVID has been about isolation. And these are individuals previous to COVID who experienced isolation of raising uh, young children alone, children with extreme uh, developmental needs and parents, many of whom who don't have the skills and understanding of the developmental needs of children to cope. Parents who face the constant struggle of simply surviving. With the funds that you provided for technology, as common uh, for some of us as this is as having electricity, for others, it's a pure luxury item. COVID taught us that technology can unify, disenfranchise people and provide a strong connection through parenting classes, early childhood education, children's integrated services who are supporting our youngest kiddos behind the starting gate, teen parents who wanted to continue their high school education in our Learning Together program and had to do so from home, and uh, additionally helping parents who, who, who face the isolation of addiction. The technology provided a link from person to person without the dangers of exposure. The CRF funds made it all possible and prevented, I believe personally, a lot of folks losing their grip and staying focused during this time. I also believe it kept children safe. Technology allowed all of our services to be continued seamlessly. In fact, parent child centers did not decrease center uh, services like many other agencies. We increased our accessibility during this time and we're on the front lines. Technology does not put gas in the car or electricity, it doesn't keep it on. The CRF funding extended to providing concrete financial supports to families at this time which included gas cards, food, phone cards, Wi-Fi for connectivity, winter clothing, and for our staff, internet, because they were shouldering the expense of working from home. Recognize that continue the virus, but to contain the virus, folks need to stay home. In order for some people to stay home, the parent child center staff had to operate directly on the front lines. Included in the spending of the CRF monies was hazard pay that honored directly many staff who are among the lowest paid in the state for their incredible work in early childhood education. Additionally, there were money spent on protective gear, cleaning supplies, structural changes that enabled opportunities for staff to interact safely with families in need. Because of the CRF funding, safety was able to be our priority. A large part of the work parent child centers accomplished focused on our youngest community members. CRF funding was able to provide families with activity bags, the technology to connect over those activity bags and outdoor gear for families to get outside and play, consequently fostering really positive and safe interactions with parents and children. Children's Integrated Services, which at my center operates at an extraordinary deficit, was able to provide developmentally appropriate materials that remained in the home. Additionally, some early childhood education daycare centers were able to provide outdoor equipment that decreased contact and possible spread of COVID among children in daycare settings. The parent child centers have a reputation for delivering high quality early childhood education across the state. These centers are not only important for helping parents to return to work and jump starting our economy, but they impact long term outcomes for Vermont's children. Research has indicated that COVID, uh, COVID's impact on low income minority and learning disabled children um, is devastating. Parent child centers have worked hard to mitigate the impact of these. 
one year of learning loss for a child posits a lifetime loss of $80,000 in income. The, and that's one year. The economic impact of children's learning loss for uh, at the national level is $98 billion. So children's learning loss is everyone's problem. The impact on the local level will be felt in the healthcare industry over time and increased crime, incarceration, and political participation of these children when they grow up. Um, CRF funding that supports continuation of early childhood education, uh, our after school program, lost revenue, and school age programs are critical to us in mitigating the impact of this in Vermont over time. The Child Development Division had requirements for reopening childcare centers and consequently reopening the economy. Parent child centers, which operate at a 30% structural deficit, simply did not have the money to make these renovations. And at the same time, we were losing revenue that supports continuation of services. Um, providing opportunities to us to compensate for some of our revenue loss kept us in the playing field. We were so grateful. There will be a time when COVID is a thing of the past, thankfully. However, we're nowhere near that yet. Parent-child centers have historically been the trusted support system for Vermont families. The lost revenue is critical to keeping parent-child centers afloat as we continue to navigate uh, COVID and as we look forward to rebuilding our lives, our communities, and our economy and paving way forward. For more information specifically on how this uh, money played out across the Parent Child Center, please refer to the document that's provided by Action Circles on the CRF's funding at the Parent Child Center. Thank you for hanging in there with me for your time and for all you have done, with, done for us. And thank you for considering ongoing funding, ensuring that Parent Child Centers will be able to continue their work with their Vermont families when, all of the, when the mess actually is bigger at the end of all this. Thank you for your time. I go ahead. Yes, uh, thank you very much. I, but I, I do want to encourage um, consolidation of testimony. Yep. If you're repeating anything that Mary said, if you could, uh, okay. Yep, I'm not. Well, there you go. Okay. <laughs> thank Ready you, Donna. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Hi, I'm Donna Bailey, and uh, I am the co chair of the Parent Child Center Network, and I'm the director of the Addison County Parent Child Center. Um, I will say thank you a million times. I know you've all heard it, but um, so I will move on, but thank you so much for the allocation of funds and thinking so thoughtfully. I have never been more proud to be a Vermonter than during this crisis. I, I, I think we're all pulling together and doing the best we can. That said, I think as we're looking at um, funding moving forward, we really need to think um, about, uh, to look forward and think about as organizations around long-term planning and as a state to think about what we need um, for families and our most vulnerable um, Vermonters, many of them being young children. So, um, you know, parent-child centers operate on shoesting budgets already before COVID while we were able to uh, get funding for the, th for the um, specifics already um, addressed. You know, I think it's really important that the, that funding and the situation we're in around ever increasing ever increasing demands for our services with um, no new resources is not sustainable. So we come to you, um, you know, looking at losses of funding, trying to find new ways to support families in this new world. We do not know the impacts of COVID in the long term on children and families. So we do not know that. So we want to be here and be available and be learning and um, be on top of that. So I, I come to you with a specific request for the Parent Child Center Network um, of $3 million. Um, that would give $200,000 to each parent child center um, in order to have some flexibility to uh, provide the needs um, for families as, as we see fit and as are appropriate for these funds. Um, you know, as you know, we've been we've used COVID money to date for very concrete, basic needs, making sure that families stay safe during these hard times. There's a breadth and depth to the work that we do on a daily basis. It's multi generational approach. Um, services are broad, and we have you know work with multiple other agencies and issues, including homelessness, helping our families find new jobs, education, providing guidance and counseling, as well as helping families with new babies. 
The broader vision that I've seen and we've all seen here in Vermont and for families, for our families, and I want to say as someone who also runs an organization of staff, we have 32 staff in our own, uh, in our own parent child center, but for hundreds of parent child center folks across the state, these have been tough times and living on the edge. And as people moved to working remotely and from home base, we realized that access to the internet um, and broadband services is crucial to this work. Not only is it crucial for children, and being able to communicate for schools and education and care and for health and telecommuni um, telecommunication has been critical. Um, it's also, you know, really important for, for our staff to be able to do their work from home. And that's not just the case for us, as you all well know. Um, but what I want to talk about is universal access and ask for um, us to think about universal access to broadband services. Families um, need this in Vermont. And, and it's not just about where there are no services. It's also about affordability. So we need access and affordability for all Vermonters to be able to move forward in an equi equitable way. I also um, think that this time has uh, made it clear that that's true for health care as well. Um, many Vermonters are without health care, don't know where they're going to get vaccines, much less care for um, COVID and other situations. So I think um, we that this, this uh, pandemic has highlighted that, and I hope that we can um, really move forward in Vermont towards that goal of making sure that every Vermonter is covered. So, and that's a right that, and accessibility for all of us. Thank you for your support. The Parent Child Center Network is work, also working with senators right now to have legislation introduced this year, which updates our statutes and finan adds financial supports. And while that's not why we're here today, I just wanted to say that out loud um, because I think our ongoing support um, helps all the, uh, vulnerable Vermonters. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good job. You, you did it effectively. Um, and so and last but not least, and Sarah, I, I just want to apologize, but say you are extremely patient and we appreciate that. And we look forward to your testimony. So uh, why don't you go ahead uh, for Disability Rights Vermont? Great. Thanks so much. Can you all hear me? Okay, hi, so I'm Sarah Launderville and I'm the executive director of the Vermont Center for Independent Living, but I'm also the president of Vermont Coalition for Disability Rights. And I'm just gonna highlight, you have written testimony from me and a bunch of um, other documents um, that has been posted. Um, like everyone else, I wanna say thank you for the hard work in response to this pandemic. Um, and I appreciate the opportunity to testify today. Our member organizations, um, are hoping also that um, the committees will also hear directly from individuals with disabilities, um, directly about some of the experiences that they've had during the pandemic. Um, the Vermont Association for the Blind and Visually Impaired received $100,000 to provide training on various devices, such as iPhones, iPads, and um, helping folks connect with um, family, friends, and doctors. Um, their funding expired in December, but there are still 78 people in the program, and so they're hoping that that will continue as time goes on. Um, there's a, a, a quarterly report that's um, in your packet that will help show um, the numbers of, of um, all of the work that they've done. Uh, our Vermont Family Network has seen an increase in number um, of calls that have been coming in, um, especially related to special education and concerns and the complications with schools adherence to IEPs um, now that we're in this remote and hybrid environment. And they're also working really hard to connect parents with other parents as they have seen increased struggles in isolation, food insecurity, all the things that folks have mentioned here today. Um, we also know that very low income people with disabilities, such as those on reach up have not received the same level of support that folks on the enhanced unemployment or others who got stimulus checks um, and reach up families with an adult on SSI are um, still having a percentage of that count against their benefits. So any extra costs from COVID weigh more heavily on those families. Um, as Commissioner Hutt said earlier, Vermont Center for Independent Living received over um, $900,000 as part of the federal CARES relief bill. Um, you can see in the testimony that we've spent um, some of that money on our Meals on Wheels program where we partner with senior centers um, and expanded um, the reach of who could get meals um, as well um, for those who have heightened risk around um, COVID. And we also created um, a way for people with disabilities to access funding to help pay for unique um, circumstances, 
it's called our RISE program and folks with disabilities can access up to $2,500 in um, funding. I've included a story of a person who was able to access oxygen from that fund because of the complications that health insurance have um, in changing the way that they administer programs, we were able to sort of break through that bureaucracy and help pay for oxygen. So I encourage you to take a look at that. And I've also included a report on some of the surveys that we, um, one of the surveys that we completed around grocery stores and access to food. Um, it has some information, it highlights experiences of folks with disabilities, the types of foods that they're accessing, the issues they've experienced um, with some of the food that they've received, although they're grateful, some of the food has been expired or almost expiring. Um, and it also highlights the ongoing issue that if you need grocery delivery, you can't use your EBT benefit online for most stores. Um, I will stop there. I really appreciate your support and happy to answer any questions and offline. Thank you. Listen, thank you very much. And some of the things that you've said are, are maybe critical issues that we'll have to look at. I, I suspect that the CBT card issue might be at a federal level, but um, certainly something for us to consider as we continue our work um, uh, next week on looking at new CRF and new guidelines and keeping our fingers crossed that we can continue to, can continue to support all of you who are here today, we greatly appreciate the outstanding work that you have done. And in particular, I'm always impressed with how important volunteers are in our state. Uh, and so I just wanna say thank you back to all of you. We can keep working together. Um, and I, you know, I don't think there's much more to say, but, but to everyone here, thanks. So uh, committees, uh, you, you've been outstanding today in, in perseverance and patience and everything else. We always put too much on our agendas, but uh, this is a good start. And I think it's been a great overview of the work that you all have done. And so thank you. Um, I see Brian Chena is stretching out a little bit. That's a good thing. I think we all need to do that. Yes. So I'm gonna I'm gonna sign off right now. I think uh, our meeting is complete. Uh, I know that Bill Lippert and Ann Pugh might want to say goodbye or say something, but I think we should just we've we've done we've done yeoman's work today. Thank you all. Take care. Take okay. care. <laughs>